that are covered in the in the workshop. And that's uh, instead of talking about the simple result, I will give you an overview of uh, this, this field. And from my point of view, from my experience started when I was in Caltech uh, spending three months, uh, I met there Jeff Kimball and he introduced me to the field of quantum nanophotonics. And since then, then we started working together very soon after Alejandro Gonzalez Tudela joined also my group as a postdoc. And that's where we started working on quantum simulations with many body systems with quantum nanophotonic systems. And that's what I want to talk about. So since then we have written several papers and here are the, the co-authors of these papers and different collaborators. So, um, Okay, as, as you, I don't think that I have to remind you in this in front of this audience, but many body quantum systems are very difficult to simulate with classical computers. And this happens in chemistry, in condensed matter physics, in high energy physics, and even in some other fields as well. And the reason can be easily understood if we just make even the simplest possible model to describe those systems, namely we just discretize, for example, space and make a lattice. We put a qubit or a two-level system in each of the lattice sites. And uh, we infer what is the Hamiltonian in this lattice. And once we have that, then typically in quantum physics, what we are interested in is in predicting or describing the properties, physical properties of these systems. And we know that for that, then we have to find what are the uh, wave functions corresponding to the states of these systems and their, the interactions given by the Hamiltonians. And in general, we can write the wave function, or the state of the system as a linear combination of all possible configurations. So we'll have a configuration with the first qubit is in zero, 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 one, zero, zero, one, zero. And it's very easy to convince oneself that there are two to the power n configurations. And therefore, if I want to write the state of my system, I will have to write uh, and two to the n complex numbers. So all the physical properties are encoded in these complex numbers. And if I want to describe these physical properties, I will have to compute these uh, complex numbers. And since there are two to the n, this means that in my computer, I will need a memory that will grow exponentially with n. On top of that, in order to compute these coefficients, I will have to do at least one operation for each of the coefficients. And since there is an exponential number of coefficients, then the time that it will require will also be exponential in n. So this gives a double exponential in many body problems. One is in memory and the other one is in time. And that's very unfortunate because this prevent us from doing calculations, at least exact calculations with many body systems. And we are very much limited to the number of systems that we can deal or the size of the lattices that we can, that we can compute. So typical numbers are that if you have the order of 30 of these qubits, then you typically will not be able to compute these quantities. Apart from that, so one could try to trade memory by time so for example, imagine that my computer in which I'm doing the calculation has a fixed memory, whatever uh, uh, terabytes or um, big memory that is fixed. And I want to solve a problem in which, which I need to store more coefficients that are allowed with this memory. And how do I solve the problem? When in principle it's possible, you can make the trade-off that I made you, told you before, but then the time does not grow exponentially with n, but it grows super exponentially with n typically. So this means that in practice, I mean, this, all these problems are very difficult to deal with. And that's something that people realized many years ago. And in particular, uh, Richard Feynman in 1981 wrote this visionary paper in which he claimed that we are doing something wrong and we are trying to solve many body systems with classical computers and that we should use quantum computers to do that, or at least quantum systems. And why is that? Because he said, well, if instead of writing the state of my qubits, of my n qubits, I would use n qubits, so n physical qubits, in order to store the state, I would prepare the state instead of writing it in my computer, then I will need only n qubits. And so you see that right away, my memory only grows linearly with the number of qubits. So it's actually equal to the number of qubits that I want to simulate. And therefore, already there, you get an exponential gain in memory. 
And moreover, he figured out and he thought that there could be also uh, some gain in time. And indeed, which we have seen during the last years is that people have come up with algorithms in which there is also an exponential speed up in terms of time. This is why quantum simulation is probably the best problem for which quantum computers can uh, have a quantum advantage eh, because of this double exponential that I mentioned before. Okay, so what I will do in my talk is, first of all, I will talk about a special kind of simulation, which is called analog quantum simulation, does not require a full-fledged quantum computer. And so I will just uh, describe the difference between quantum simulations and quantum computation, the advantages and disadvantages. Then I will talk about quantum simulation with nanophotonic systems, and I'll compare it to existing, some other existing devices like cold atoms in optical lattices or trap ions, and I will mention what are advantages and disadvantages of the system. Then I will give a way of simulating these quantum simulators, and out of that, then you will see that there may be some interesting ideas coming out related to, for example, the simulation of quantum chemistry problems. And at the end, if I have time, and then I'll also add this uh, third component that Lucas was mentioning in the introduction, the light. And so I will talk about how in these very same systems, then you can produce some states of light, which could be useful in metrology. But what is more important is that I think that that's where this technology has a big advantage with respect to any other existing technology in producing, let's say, highly entangled states of photons and many deterministically with high fidelities. OK, so let me start uh, with uh, analog quantum simulations. And so that's the same kind of problems that I was mentioning before. And I told you before that if you have a quantum computer, then you could solve some of the problems and there are algorithms for solving problems with quantum computers. Another possibility is to use an analog computer. And in an analog computer, what is called also an analog quantum simulator, what you would do is to just uh, have a different system than the one that you want to simulate. So you want to simulate, for example, some condensed matter system, then you don't work with this condensed matter system. You take a system that you can tame in the lab, like cold atoms in optical lattices. And then with external fields, you will tune the interactions in this simulator in such a way that they resemble the system that you want to simulate. Or in other words, I told you before that these systems are described in terms of some Hamiltonian. So what you will do is to tune your interactions with your quantum simulator in such a way that they are described by the Hamiltonian that you want to simulate. Like before here already, there is this exponential gain in memory because you just have to uh, use as num, I mean, the number of uh, quantum systems that you have to use, the number of qubits that you have to use is equal to the number of qubits that you want to simulate. There is this exponential gain. And then what you can do is just to wait and uh, wait so the system evolves according to the Hamiltonian that you're simulating and then measure. And in this way, if you repeat several times the experiment and measure many times, you will be able to predict expectation values and therefore the physical properties that you want to address. Okay, so I'll concentrate on these analog quantum simulators. And actually there are many already in the market. So the probably the most famous ones are cold atoms in optical lattices, but we have now also cold atoms in tweezers or trap ions, superconducting devices, or uh, color centers, or even photons. And people have figured out and have done already quantum simulation experiments with those systems. So with respect to analog and digital simulation or quantum computation, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? So analog, first of all, is typically not universal. So in the labs where you're doing analog simulation, then you can only uh, simulate certain kind of Hamiltonians. I give you an example. You have a system where you don't have single qubit addressing because with light you have to address all of them at the same time. Then you can only simulate Hamiltonians which are homogeneous. Uh, however, with the quantum computers, if you can change every qubit independently, then you can do universal dynamics. The second disadvantage is that there is nothing like uh, error correction. So with quantum computers, as you know, if errors are produced, in principle, you can use our quantum error correcting codes and scale up the computation and have an errorless computer if your error per gate is small, that's on even threshold. The main advantage is that they are much easier to build 
And so there are many experiments in the world that can be, I mean, just transforming to quantum simulator without too much effort. However, building a quantum computer is a bigger effort. I want to come back to this error correction and mention some advantage of quantum simulators regarding errors that sometimes are not fully uh, uh, understood or so, uh, fully um, realized. So, so typically, as I mentioned before, what we want to do is to simulate Hamiltonians. And so imagine that I have a Hamiltonian that I want to simulate, that's this one here, which is a sum of different terms. So for example, you have these atoms in a material and an atom is interacting with the next and this next with the next. So there are many terms, each corresponding to each pair of, of atoms that are in, or in pairs of electrons that are interacting with each other. And in practice, what will happen when you, when you perform any simulation is that your Hamiltonian will not be perfect. So in the simulator, then you will have a Hamiltonian which will have some error. And this error will be some, maybe some small parameter, your simulator is good. However, it will have a sum of many terms. So you can understand that in each interaction that you are creating between each pair of qubits, it will not be perfect. So the error would be epsilon for this interaction plus epsilon for some other interaction plus epsilon for some other interaction. So this will be an error, would be a small parameter, but a number of terms. And the problem that occurs is that this number of terms uh, is proportional to the size of your system. So as many as qubits you have. So you see that the value you want, the, the typical value of this operator here, what we call operator norm, is proportional to epsilon, but it's also proportional to n. So it's extensive. And so this means that if you grow and grow and grow your system, even if epsilon is small, then at some point, this will be larger than one. And this means that during the evolution, so you do uh, same evolution, then, I mean, there will be some errors. So, so you will not, you will have, I mean, this part of your Hamiltonian would be important. And that's why one, if one tries to do, uh, let's say, solving a quantum computation problem with the system, with the Hamiltonian that has a small error, it doesn't scale. And this is why you need quantum error correction. So the same problem in principle will, have, will happen with an analog quantum simulator, namely that there will be an error that would be intensive. However, and that's the important part, is that typically in quantum simulation, you're interested in, in, in intensive quantities. So you're interested in scaling your system, making it bigger, 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 and knowing what is the energy per particle or magnetization per Per, per particle, things like that. So you divide by the number of particles. And it turns out that then, if there are some errors that are extensive, the errors per particle would be small still. So this means that in practice, even if you have these errors, since this problem that you're solving is not like the ones that you're solving typically with quantum computers, but the problem in which you're interested in some physical properties, then these errors are not so important. So in other words, if you're doing a quantum computation, in which you want to factorize a big number. And in the middle of the computation, I flip one qubit, then the computation will be completely spoiled. So at the end, the number that you will get will have nothing to do with the factor. However, if you're doing one of these quantum simulations and one of the flip, uh, one of the, the, the qubits flip, then still, when you measure an intensive quantity, then the error will be of the order of one over n. And that's why quantum simulations are very important because I mean, you don't have, in principle, to use quantum error correction, and then you can get sensitive, sensible results already with existing devices. Now, of course, this discussion is a kind of a very qualitative discussion. It's very hard to make rigorous what I said here. However, we have strong evidence by experiments that this is true. And one typical example of that is the first experiment, I mean, uh, we'd say that in quantum simulation, that was done with op op atoms in optical lattices. This is the well-known uh, uh, super uh, fluid uh, mode transition, mode insulator transition. Then what uh, they did is with atoms in optical lattices, then they uh, simulated some Hamiltonian. And then it was known that for some parameters of the Hamiltonian, then they would observe some phase of matter. They measure something and it looked like that. And then the prediction is that if they change the coefficients, then there would be a different uh, 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 say phase of matter, which will give a signal which is like that. And you see that they are completely different. And you can see it with your bare eye. And in the experiment, actually, this epsilon that is here was quite high, but still they were able to answer the physical question very well. So with that, I'm emphasizing the role of analog quantum simulators to solve some physical properties and physical uh, questions that may 
not require quantum computing. And even with the devices that we are building now, then you will be able to do that. Okay, so in that, uh, so once I have said that, let me just emphasize that. So what would be the goal of an analog simulator? Well, first, maybe to solve specific problems, for example, solve Hubbard model and to see if there is a D-way superconductivity in the ground state. Also providing the understanding. So you know what is the ground state, you can prepare the ground state and you can measure and try and, 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 and try to understand what is happening more from a physical point of view rather than a numerical point of view. Also to discover phenomena. So you can also simulate some uh, systems that they don't exist in nature, but that maybe can be built. And then you can uh, uh, discover in this way some new phenomena. And also I think that this is probably for me the most important to benchmark theory. So whenever you're dealing with quantum many body systems and you do a theory, this theory will not be exact, it will be many approximations and they're typically uncontrolled. So you would like to have an experiment in which you can test your theory because this is a way in which you can do advance between, I mean, just working back and forth between theory and experiments. Okay, so now uh, let me move to quantum simulations with nanophotonic systems. And so the idea here is to use uh, photonic crystals with some periodic structures, like the one that is represented in this drawing, and then to have emitters around the system. So for example, here is something that we considered some time ago, where atoms would be levitated on top of these uh, photonic systems. And now these atoms that are here, sorry, these emitters that are here, atoms, could be atoms, then they will interact with each other and this interaction can be mediated by the photonic crystal. And in this way, you have some effective interactions in your system. And these effective interactions between your system will give rise to some model that you can, that you can simulate. And so therefore, the idea is to use the photonic crystal to engineer and enhance the interactions in your set of emitters. And in this way, I mean, reach some models that, for example, you could not have with, you could not simulate with other systems. So how does this compare with uh, the atoms in optical lattices? It's the system that I mentioned before in which atoms are levitated, but now in free space without a dielectric. It's the same, but without a dielectric. Well, in both systems, in principle, you can have bosons, fermions, or spins. You can change the geometry. So in this way, just by building a different photonic crystal here by changing your lasers. So you can work in different dimensions. So here in one dimension, two dimension, three dimensions, at least with atoms will be hard, but you can do it with a human plant, but in the case of Peter Lodal, uh, your, your emitters there. And, and uh, now in the case of cold atoms, then these are quite flexible, but you're limited to simulating local interactions. So even if you use now Rydberg atoms or molecules, then the interactions decay with the distance like one over r cube. And this is a short range interaction. This is considered to be short range interaction. So even though it looks like a power law decay, then the interactions are decay very, very, very fast. So most of the physics that you can simulate with these systems is related to local uh, uh, systems. And this has applications in condensed massive physics and high energy physics. So the advantage of the systems, as we see, is that you can get non-local interactions. So in fact, the fact that you have here your photonic crystal can induce very, very long range interactions that are impossible with a system like that, at least in principle. And for example, you can have interactions that decay like one over R, like in Coulomb interactions, or even like log one over R, which as I mentioned before, these are uh, very, very long range interactions. And this gives rise to some exotic models that have not even been considered in the context of condensed matter physics. Okay, so let me give you some examples of that. Okay, so that's the typical system. So you have a system like that, that you can model, either make a toy model out of that, or just take a real system and do a, I mean, a complicated calculation to, first of all, look at their photonic crystal. In the photonic crystal, you have certain band structure that you can compute with the different TM or TE modes. And what you will see is that the, you design well your photonic crystal, at some point there might be some, some band gap, like it is the case here for the TE modes. So that's a toy representation that I will use later on. So you can have like a dispersion relation right, as a function of your momentum because you have some uh, periodic structure and there's a frequency and you'll have certain bands. And then you can consider that you are resonant with the band. So your, your emitters now will have some transition frequency and the transition frequency can be resonant with the band or can be 
uh, in the band gap. So for example, here in the middle of the band gap, and then you have a very different behavior. So the way that you can do that, I mean, just following standard techniques in quantum optics, just doing Born and Markov approximation. In the first case, if you're in the band gap, then what you can do is to get what is an effective Hamiltonian for the emitters. So now the emitters can absorb and emit photons virtually because they are not resonant. And this provides some effective interactions among the emitters. And so you can get an effective Hamiltonian, which will describe your system. Or if you're in the, in the, in the, in the band, you're resonant with the modes of demand, then you, will, you can derive this some master equation. So I will concentrate on this here, the case in which we have now the two, the, the, the transition of your emitter is uh, in the band gap. So in this case is very well known that uh, this will induce dipole-dipole interactions. So here is a bit more sophisticated version of dipole-dipole interactions. So imagine that your emitter has two hyperfine ground state levels or electronic ground state levels, zero and one, and one electronically excited level E, and the second emitter, which is in somewhere else, has the same structure. So what you can do is that you can drive with an external laser the transition zero E of resonance, like it's represented here, and the same thing for the same for emitter two. So you just share, shine some laser light uh, that's acting on all your emitters. And so what may happen is that one emitter absorbs a photon from the laser, emits a photon in the photonic crystal, that's a virtual photon. This virtual photon is absorbed by some other emitter and this emits spont uh, stimulated, with stimulated emission back to the laser. And so you see in this transition, in this virtual transition, what has happened is that the first emitter has changed from the state zero to the state one. Whereas the second emitter has changed from the state one to the state zero. And of course, now this will give rise to some Hamiltonian, which is this, the one that has this flip-flop kind of term in the meter n and the meter m. And now the coefficient that you will have in front will, will depend on the distance, will depend on the kind of photonic crystal that you have, and will depend on the, on the parameters of your system. And this is what you can change now by using different geometries, or different dimensions. And, uh, and now what it turns out that once you have something like that, and if the interactions have long range, so meaning that this j that is here does not decay too fast, then now using tricks, just putting some external uh, 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 radio frequency fields or Raman transitions, or I mean, shifting magnetic fields, et cetera, et cetera. It is possible to engineer any Hamiltonian of this kind. This was shown in this paper. So what I'm saying is that you could simulate the systems directly, but also with a little bit of more experimental effort, then you can simulate more general systems. I will not talk about here. I will concentrate on this and give you a couple of examples of how these kind of dipole dipole interactions that are induced depend on the distance. And so what you can do is that you can take first a square lattice in two dimensions for your photonic crystal. And then you get what I told you before. You get that the interactions decay like logarithm of one divided by the distance. And you can understand that because this dependence on the distance is the same as quantum electrodynamics in two dimensions. So what happens here is that if you have a two dimensional system and you have electrodynamics in this two dimensional system, that's why you get this like, like, the, like the kind of interactions in a two dimensional system. And this is extremely long range, as I mentioned before. Okay, so now you can take different lattices and you can do, I mean, the exercise with different kinds of lattices. For example, what happens if you take, have something that has a honeycomb geometry like this one here, and then you can also derive. And what you will find, for example, is something very exotic. The first thing is that here, there is dipole, in, dipole interaction only between the red and the green dots. So there is no dipole-dipole interaction between red and red dots. So this is what is represented here. And also the dipole-dipole interaction in this case, the case like one divided by the distance. And this is the, the reason for that is the existence of the Dirac cone. And here you're assuming that the two level uh, transition is exactly uh, tuned to this uh, Dirac point. And so, as I mentioned before, this gives long range interactions and some kind of sophisticated systems. You can also put now in your path, a more sophisticated path. So for example, some structure path that is topological. And so this is, for example, what happens if you have 
Now, a photonic crystal, which uh, has a double periodicity, like this one here, this gives rise to what is called the SSH model. And the SSH model is a symmetry-protected model. It has symmetry-protected phase, so typically say that this topological actually is uh, symmetry-protected. And so what happens is that this photonic crystal has a dispersion relation. The unit cell, you can see it here, is two, so it has two bands. And so it opens up a gap depending on the parameters. And here, your this transition frequency in the gap then this, uh, uh, what I mentioned before, the method that I mentioned before will give rise to these dipole-dipole interactions because you're in the band gap. And these dipole-dipole interactions somehow inherit the topological properties of your path, something that we look at some time ago. And so what happens uh, to want to be very long is that first of all, if you are in the band gap, then uh, if you have a single emitter, it will have a bound state, but the bound state will be only localized to the right or to the left of the emitter. So there is a, a reflection, and there is a, a breaking of this reflection symmetry. And so now you have several emitters, like for example, you have two emitters here. Then if they have, uh, for example, if they are in the B lattice, or in, uh, let's say, like, let's call the black dots, because there is this double periodicity, the A and the white dots, the B lattice, if you are in the A lattice, then it turns out that your bond state is only, uh, uh, let's say, on the left, is on the left of, of your, of your uh, where the emitter is coupled. And if your emitter is coupled to the B lattice, then it will be on the right. So it means that in this case, there will be no dipole dipole interaction. They cannot exchange any photons. However, if they are the other way around, that like is here, then they can exchange these virtual photons and then you get some interaction. So at the end, if you have many emitters then you see that you have a very exotic model where the interact, I mean, the, the particles all interact with the right and some of the particles don't interact with the left. And so we studied the phase diagram and we saw, for example, that there are phase transitions and there are sophisticated phases like double nil phases in the system. So again, so what I want to say is that, okay, so you put emitters in these band gap uh, uh, materials and you can uh, engineer now, how is the photonic crystal? Then you can have access to very exotic phenomena, to very exotic model, and some of them, and most of them have not been studied. And then you get the exotic uh, exotism because first of all, you have very long range interactions. And second, because you can have, you can design this kind of topological paths or all the kind of paths, and this will give rise to very exotic effective Hamiltonians. Okay, so we also, uh, 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 with the calculations for three dimensional systems for different lattices. And what I want to remark is here in three dimensions, if you have just the simplest lattice, like the uh, cubic lattice, then the Hamiltonian that you get, if you go to the appropriate limit, uh, describes an interaction, a dipole dipole interaction with the case like one over R in three dimensions. Okay, so now again, there will be a flip flop. And if you want this flip flop, the Rabi frequency for this flip flop will decay, will decay with the distance like one over R, but now in three dimensions. So before I was talking about the honeycomb lattice in two dimensions and it decays like one over R. Uh, but if you go to three dimensions already with a cubic lattice, it decays like one over R. And as I will mention in a second, this is very important for uh, uh, quantum simulations of uh, chemical systems or chemical uh, quantum chemistry. Okay, so uh, let me move on and now talk about simulating the simulator. Okay, so the quantum simulator is this uh, photonic crystal with some emitters on top that I mentioned before. And now what I want to do is to say that actually with cold atoms in optical lattices, it is possible to simulate the simulator under some conditions. And this will be important. And as I want to argue, because we saw that in this system, we could have these Coulomb interactions in three dimensions. And uh, however, the problem is that if you build a three dimensional system, then your atoms will not be able to move there because they will have to be implanted in your system, probably. And therefore, if you want to simulate something that has one over R interactions, like it happens in chemistry, when you have Coulomb interactions between electrons, then this would not be possible in three dimensions, but this is how it would be possible to do that with atoms in optical lattice. Actually, this was where our inspiration came for this uh, proposal of simulation. So let me show you how you can do the simulation. And it's a very simple remark. And actually it was uh, shown in this paper many years ago that where we showed how to, with call atoms, you could simulate quantum electrodynamics. The idea is now, let me change the system. Okay, I'm not talking about nanophotonics. I go to the field of cold atoms in optical lattices 
and imagine that I have atoms moving in optical lattices like before. I can move here and hop from potential well to potential well. And imagine that these atoms have also some hyperfine structure, some level E and some level A. But in such a way that if atoms are in, in this level E, they are deeply trapped, so they cannot tunnel. They are here. And if they are in this level A, then they see a different potential. This is this potential here, and they can move. And now imagine that you just take a laser and couple these two internal states, for example, through some Raman laser. And then it will be possible to change for the state, this atom that is trapped here, from the level E to the level A. And if it's in level A, it can move away and co can move now, right? And so you write, what is the Hamiltonian for that? And it's very simple to see that this Hamiltonian is nothing else but the same Hamiltonian as the one of uh, these atoms coupled to these photonic crystals or these emitters coupled to photonic crystals, the ones that I was dealing with before. Okay, so it means that some of the experiments that I was mentioning before could also be done with whole atoms in optical lattices. And so one of them, for example, the existence of, uh, of bound states on the system, something that is known for many years, was observed in Stony Brook a couple of years ago, exactly with this simulation. Now, okay, so now to make it more clear, so you see, this is the analogy between the two systems. So before we had an emitter, which can have an excited state and a ground state. I forgot now, I, I, I sorry, I, I don't write here the, the Raman transition, but just take a two level system. And now there is the photonic crystal here where there are photons that can move. Then for example, you can have that the atom can go from the excited state to the ground state and emit a photon that may propagate now in this photonic crystal. And if you have different atoms, then you can have, for example, one atom in the ground state, another in the ground state, another in the excited state, and several photons here. Okay, that corresponds to the situation that we have been talking so far. Now, there is an equivalent situation now this with these called atoms. And this corresponds to the one in which you will have an atom just in this position here and no atom here. So this plays the role of having an atom and uh, an emitter in the excited state. Now, if you have that this atom is not here, but is there. So now there is no occupation here. So this would be like in the state not occupied. This is like the state G. And now there is an atom here which plays the role of the photon that is moving here. So that's the analogy. So the excitation here is the presence of the absence of the atom here. And the photon here is the presence of the atom there. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So for example, now you have different potentials here. Then you can have, for example, one atom there, which means that there is like an excitation here, no atom, no atom. So there is no excitation, no excitation, and maybe three photons, uh, three atoms here. So it's like three photons. So that's completely equivalent. And we use this fact now combined to what I told you before. No, and that's, that's so this means that the Hamiltonian is the same. So we use that in order to uh, propose a quantum simulation of a quantum chemistry experiment. And so the idea is that in quantum chemistry, then I mean, you can have the position of a nuclear, the position of another nucleus, and then there would be electrons that are attracted by the nuclei and they are repelled to each other. And so typically what you want to do in chemistry, one of the main problems is that you fix the position of the nuclei and then you want to compute what is the electronic energy. Now you separate the, the distance more and more and more and you compute what is the energy and this will give you the molecular core, the energy as a function of the position of the nuclear. And that's something that you could do now. And so that's the, the Hamiltonian that you typically have. Let me explain it here. How would this happen with, with coal atoms? So this could happen because now you could use fermions in a lattice to represent the electrons. So this will play the role of the electrons. You can have some focus laser beams which represent the attraction of the nuclear to the electrons. And on the other hand, so how can you get now the interactions between elect electrons that would decay like one over R. So I told you before that cold atoms have only long range interactions. So the idea is to use an other atom that would mediate the interaction between these systems. And so actually I don't have time to explain it, but if you go to the models that I had before for atomic crystals and it turns out that the problem is very similar to that. And if you just write the problem, then you see that this is mediating this one over R potential that I described before in terms of photonic crystals. So in practice, then you will have like electrons moving, 
mediate and, and the interaction between electrons are mediated by atoms. And in this way, you could do this, this simulation. It would be nice to have something similar with photonic crystals. We have thought about ideas of doing that. We don't get all the way quantum chemistry. So we don't get exactly these Hamiltonians because we have some excitations. So what we are playing is that, uh, I mean, it's not that the particles are moving, but the excitations in the particles can have similar Hamiltonians. However, they are bosons. But still, I mean, even though this would not represent a, uh, a situation in chemistry, this could be used to benchmark this, uh, these numerical methods that I mentioned before. So I see that my time is running out. So I just wanted to say something about uh, uh, photonic fox states. And let me just say it in a, in, in a word. OK, so once you have your emitters coupled to this uh, uh, photonic man gap, another possibility is to excite them and to let them emit photons. And some time ago, so we thought of a way of generating entangled states of photons just by entangling the emitters themselves. But at that time, we were very concerned about the following problem. You have an emitters and you excite most of them. And now they emit photons, then the photons will not be single mode. So they will be emitted in many modes. And it's very simple to show that because these emitters are nonlinear. They provide a nonlinearity and automatically right away, you don't have a, a, a single mode. So what we figure out is that you have many more emitters than excitations in your atoms. Once you release them, when they emit, then you don't see the nonlinearity as well. And therefore, then you will have a single mode and there will be light coming out single, fold, single mode. And that's uh, how you can generate some arbitrary states that could be used for something like metrology. Actually, it was, uh, I was giving a talk in, in Erlangen and, and I gave uh, a talk. After that, I talked to Vahit and Vahit told me, but why don't you just use all the atoms excite them, and so what? There are many modes, so what? And then I said, what, so what? Yes, so what? So what we thought is that then, of course, there will be n photons coming out. And in fact, because of super radiance, then there is a, a super poor cell factor that emits all these photons there. It's not like n, it goes like n square. So actually, there is a, a huge uh, 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 say enhancement. But what is more important is that even though these are not single modes, they can be used for metrology. So you get a Heisenberg limit even if they are not single modes. So that's, I think, a very interesting kind of experiments to use this, uh, I mean, systems with many emitters and photonic crystals to generate now Fox states with a very high probability and uh, that can be used directly even if they are not single mode for metrology. And it turns out that with these methods, if you do a back of the envelope calculation, that you will see that you will beat any other existing system in fidelities in the number of Fox states that you can create and so on. So I think that that's a very experimental, interesting system. And with that, I think I would like to finish because my time is up. So I was talking about a quantum simulation. And I mean, maybe the message that is that is that these nanophotonic systems can be very, very interesting for quantum simulation because you will be able to simulate very exotic models with them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ignacio. This was a very clear talk, almost a tutorial, a beautiful um, for me to, to, to have this overview. Um, we only have one minute for questions and I, I'm not sure whether I'm handling this um, chat room correctly I might not see the questions, but I have questions. I have actually three, but I will condense it to one symmetry. Okay, so 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 you basically you showed okay uh, the case for different symmetries, and I ask myself, what if you don't have symmetry? Is is symmetry a necessary condition? Can I conceive like a fractal arrangement or um, or a quasi crystal? Um, what would be the consequences of that? Okay, so I think that that's a very, very interesting idea. This will give rise to some exotic model. What I could imagine is that the simple thing that will happen, the specific, uh, uh, specific or the simple phenomenon that will happen there will be under some localization. Okay, so at the end, what you will have like will be the many bound states that are localized, and then there will be some interactions at short range. So at the end, you will have some kind of short range model with random couplings. And so that's, that's my guess. But I think that that's very interesting. And if you would have something fractal, it would be even more interesting. Yeah. So, so that would allow me to address probably Hamiltonians that would otherwise not be addressable? Or would you say this would just be a subset of what is possible? I think that this would be a subset of what is possible. So I think that there is a lot of flexibility. So with the nanofabrication techniques, you probably have access even to put some of the randomness 
at, at will and combine randomness with something and then get many exotic models that people have not figured out because they didn't exist. Okay, so people didn't study them. And then I guess that there is a bunch of phenomena that will appear in those systems that we have that we don't understand that we don't know, actually. Okay, thanks. Then there are two questions. I only see that two people say I have a question, but I don't know what the question is. <laughs> Frank, it's you, uh, Frank Coppins. Tell me what your question is. I cannot unmute you. I'm really sorry. Okay, um, yes, this was probably not clear to everybody. Um, I don't have the capacity to unmute you. So the rule is you have to type your question so I can read it. Now, the question is, who is typing the fastest? <laughs> so the question is, here we go, okay. Sorry, Frank, you were not the fastest. Okay, this uh, question is by Sarush Abbasi Zargele. What are the possibilities to use color center arrays with localized electron and nuclear spin for quantum simulation? Okay, so very briefly, so there have been some proposals, I think that in the group of Martin Plenio and Fedor Jalesko have made proposals for quantum simulations now using NV centers, I mean, not with photonic crystals, but just that they interact directly, either uh, with mag magnetically. Okay, and then I allow one more question. This is now from Frank. Okay, can you simulate other Hamiltonians than dipole-dipole, for example, with other type of lattices that are more exotic? What about Kogimi lattices? Yeah, so there would be, so in fact, so if you have nanofabrication, you can build your Kagome lattice, you will have a Kagome lattice. And uh, as I mentioned, then you have to use a couple of techniques using lasers, time dependent lasers. And if you do that, then you can simulate more exotic than this dipole dipole interaction. So you can exotic, uh, you, can, you can simulate what is called XYZ models in, in condensed matter physics, but now with very exotic systems. So there, I'm sure that there will be a lot of topological spin liquid, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, chiral models etc cetera, etc cetera. so i mean if i mean the problem there is of course to get the, the experimental let's say uh, to get rid of imperfections and things like that and to see how they affect but the the, the, the possibilities is infinite basically with the system okay thank you there are more but i have to cut it off here sorry arno there is one more from arno rauschenbeutel so please respond to this by email thank you ignacio and we move on to the next talk so the next talk will be by Peter Lodal. Uh, Peter, oh yeah, he's already here. Fantastic. Yes, I'm here. I don't see your camera. I don't see your face, Peter. You don't? I don't, no. Maybe it's just me, but I don't see you. Should be on. Uh, I see myself, at least, on the camera. Okay, so I leave it to the IT guys to make sure that they everybody sees you. you I see, see your eyes? presentation. Okay. Okay, so uh, next talk is by Peter Lodal, Niels Bohr Institute in uh, Copenhagen. Take it away, Peter. Hey, thank you very much, Lucas. And uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak. Of course, I would have loved to do this in Benaski instead and see you all there, but uh, this is better than nothing. So I will talk about the deterministic photon emitter, emitter interfaces uh, and about integrated quantum photonics methods of controlling these systems. I'm from the Niels Bohr Institute at the University of Copenhagen. And the platform uh, that I present is a, a good old fashioned uh, photonic crystal platform with self assembled quantum dots sitting inside the structures. So you see an image of, of a typical structure here. It's a membrane, 160 nanometers thin. It's made of gallium arsenide, and we are drilling holes to create photonic band gap structures, and we are putting single emitters inside waveguides and cavities to enhance light metal interaction. So there are essentially two qubits that we can play with. So there's a, we can produce single photons on demand in these structures. So that's an electron hole pair in the quantum lock that recombines emitting a photon. And uh, we can also start to play with spin degrees of freedom by tunneling in a single electron or single hole and coherently manipulate the spin to have spin qubits in the system. And my talk today will be about both. So I'll be saying something about photon generation, something about spin qubits as well. And uh, well, the figure of merit, one important figure of merit is the coupling efficiency of each factor. What's the probability that this quantum dot emits into the waveguide? This is really high because we have Purcell enhancement and we have a band gap that suppresses leakage to unwanted modes. 
and we can set lower bounds of, of this beta factor being being really high close to unity and of course as you say this is really many uh, groups around the world that is working on various implementations of these quantum dot based photonic cavities and waveguides uh, vertical micro pillar cavities and and and, uh, and integrated planar platforms that i'll be talking about here and you'll hear more about quantum dot uh, experiments also later in this um, conference um, so the beta factor is a figure of merit of the single photon source. So it's literally uh, what's the probability that once the quantum dot emits, that it emits a photon into a single propagating mode in the waveguide. But I think very importantly, this coupling efficiency is also much more because it's also linked to the quantum cooperativity. So cooperativity is beta divided by one minus beta. So if beta is close to one, you have a very high quantum cooperativity. And the quantum cooperativity is the fundamental light matter uh, coupling efficiency. So how well do I interface a single photon and a single emitter? So also the figure of merit for photonic quantum gates and enabling multi-photon entanglement generation and so on. But uh, on the one uh, very serious um, assumptions I made here, so written this very uh, simple um, formula here only holds in the case if I have a perfect emitter inside this photonic nanostructure. So all decoherence processes will significantly reduce this quantum cooperativity and it won't be only the beta factor anymore that is a figure of merit. So this formula only holds if I have a perfect emitter, no broadening, so uh, uh, apart from spontaneous emission, so only a transform limited emitter. So the first part of my talk is about single photon sources and, uh, and coming back to this question about the, the perfect transform limited emitter, this is really where I think there has been quite dramatic progress on the quantum dot platform uh, over the past uh, five to 10 years, particularly spearheaded by uh, Richard Warburton's group in Basel, who showed that you can get transform limited emission lines of quantum dots if you put electrical contacts on these structures. So you're really making the best out of this heterostructure so that you can grow in, a, in a gallium mass like material so that you can apply a voltage and control the voltage across the quantum dot. Uh, and that has essentially three uh, advantageous features. I mean, it really gives a lot of screening. Uh, so you have, it has a charge screening effect to reduce uh, spectral diffusion in these systems because charges will be everywhere in the semiconductor. So you'll need to, to, to uh, turn these carriers away in order to get a stable emission line not broadened by spectral diffusion. And Richard's group really showed that, that, that you can reduce this charge noise uh, completely in these uh, photonic structures. Uh, you can also use that to tune the excitons. So you see here that, that with the controlling the gate voltage across the quantum dot, you can tune the quantum dot excitons. And finally, it allows you to control the charge state. So you can uh, do uh, either neutral excitons, or you can turn it single spins and start to do spin physics in these systems as well. So Richard's group has been working very much on the bulk structure. So together, we really set out to do, can you get that very nice performance that they have demonstrated also in the photonic nanostructure. So now remember these membranes are 160 nanometers thin. You have quantum dots at least 80 nanometers away from, from surface, surface state, surface defects, all this jazz uh, can give rise to charge uh, fluctuation. Okay, so um, let me tell you about then the performance for, for the single photon emission in the first case. So these are quite simple experiments. You have the quantum dot sitting in a photonic crystal waveguide here. You're exciting it with a pulse laser from the top. We can nicely access the quantum dot from the top. And we are channeling these photons into a single propagating mode waveguide. And those are just the specs that we reached uh, recently. You can generate with high emission rate, uh, 10 to the four megahertz photons when you were applying pure resonant excitation. So applying a pi pulse to the quantum dot here. Um, we also look at the uh, G2 to see uh, what's the multi-photon contributions in these uh, in these pulses that we're generating and see that it can be strongly suppressed in a Hamburg round twist experiment. And then most importantly, if you're looking at the G2 correlation function here, also on longer time scales, so you see here up to, to 100 microseconds, you really see if any blinking is going on due to that the charges will be trapped in, 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 in defect states or so. If the quantum goes dark while it emits, it's not such a of, of so much use that you can produce these photons, you know, if the quantum dot is, is dark for, 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 for long periods of time. And those measurements here really show that you can overcome this blinking out to uh, on these very long time scales. 
So that essentially means that with this very high beta factor, then you can really get you know, photons on demand, uh, photons coming one at a time, propagating into the, the waveguide here. And then you can start to demultiplex this source because then there's actually a pathway to generate many single photon sources at the same time. All you need to do is to switch these photons or so have high efficiency switches to route them into different waveguides, sticking in, a, sticking in an optical delay, delay so that you get in photons on demand. So how many you can get is really a matter of how well can you do all the switching and routing and coupling into fibers and so on. So one spec that I haven't told you about yet is, well, what's the photon indistinguishability? So how good can these single photons interfere? So that's a Hong Mandel experiment. We take uh, the stream of photons here on a max intensive barometer. We stick in a variable delay in one of the arms here and look at quantum interference between subsequently emitted photons from the same device. And when varying the delay, we can look at, well, photon one and two interference, photon one and 40, and photon one and out to photon 115, we have explicitly tested in this experiment. And um, you see here the photon indistinguishability as a function of this delay, showing that you can have indistinguishabilities reaching out to, to well, chains of 115 single photons with, with high indistinguishability of 96%. I think we get 98% now in the best experiment. Um, so I should also say we also very much, or we know exactly what is the limiting factor. So 98 would be what we have in the lab at the moment. Maybe you want to go even higher than that. Well, then you have to work on phonon processes. So this is the limiting factor here is phonon decoherence processes. Uh, that is the uh, decoherence mechanism that, that, is, that kicks in on the time scales uh, in, in the experiment here. So there are actually also pathways to push these numbers even further. Um, so uh, what about the line width? Uh, can we get transform limited emission line width uh, in these nanostructures? That's actually a, even harder, uh, a harder requirement, a tougher requirement than the indistinguishability because doing line width measurements, you're sensitive to all noise processes also on like millisecond time scale. So all uh, charge noise, uh, nuclear spin noise that is uh, giving diffusion also on, on, on longer time scales will broaden the line. And here we, have, we are doing these line width measurements in these gated uh, PIN structures where we're doing transmission measurements across or through uh, the waveguide. We have the quantum not sitting in the waveguide. We're sending weak coherent laser through and, 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 and seeing the extension, the strong extension of just a single quantum rod on this uh, coherent laser, meaning that the copying efficiency is really high. And when we are then looking at the line width here, we can compare this line width and see how much uh, broadening do you have compared to the natural line with, of, the, of the system obtained by measuring the decay time of the quantum dot. And if you're comparing over here the red and the blue uh, point, you'll see this little residual broadening that you have, uh, uh, which is uh, how close we get to have transform limited emission lines in these photonic nanostructures. And you also see like 50 different quantum dots have been reported here. So this is really, you know, just one quantum dot that has very, very nice in the structure. And that works because we have these excellent low noise uh, heterostructures. Uh, the, okay, so the, what's the role of this finite uh, uh, degree of indistinguishability, even though it's high, 96%, is it actually good enough to do, to reach in, into the quantum advances regime of bosom sampling, which requires about 50 photons. So we are calculating here the variational separation of our uh, resource compared to a, a, an ideal uh, bosom sampler uh, that would be delta equal to one would be the ideal boson sampler. And now we're benchmarking. Now I send in my 115 photons with 96% indiscretability and see how close I am I to getting the right result. That's the curve that you're seeing up here, up here. And you can see that in the quantum advanced regime here, you can get still a, a, a significant uh, delta, a variation of distance here, uh, uh, reaching into the regime. 
we are benchmarking in order towards state-of-the-art uh, experiments, the actual boson sampling experiment uh, carried out by Jen, Jan Wai Pan and Xiaoyang Lu, where they did a 20 photon experiment with a conduct source. In this case, however, their indistinguishability was decaying out in the chain. So you're actually seeing that the benefit of scaling up to additional number of photons, uh, you would not benefit much from doing that. But with these improved sources, uh, you could really go further. The other requirement is obviously the efficiency. So how long should I wait? How long should I run my uh, quantum simulation algorithm? Uh, how long can I accept to run it? Well, probably a typical integration time would be like 30 days would be something we could run in an experiment. And here we're looking at what efficiency on the source would I actually require in order to, um, to, to in 30 days run uh, a boson sampling experiment. And if you want to get in the quantum advantage regime, you need to reach uh, 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 an efficiency, a source efficiency, meaning really what's the probability that my source delivers a photon into a fiber with larger than 78%. And this is actually something that is doable with the outcopy methods that we are implementing in the lab. And maybe you've also heard about the explicit boson sampling uh, experiment uh, carried out by uh, Jiang Wai Pan group uh, a few months ago. That was using uh, squeeze light beams uh, as opposed to the uh, single photon qubits I was talking about here. But the point is that, that these kind of actual setups to, to, to couple all these photons uh, with, with sufficiently high efficiency, they can actually construct over there. So the, so, so the message here is essentially that the improved chips, improved sources that we are developing could be uh, plugged into a boson sampling a quantum simulator uh, like, like illustrated here and do an explicit explicit quantum advantage demonstration. And then you can say, okay, what is that good for? Um, well, I think it's, it's, it's something significant, at least for us hardware people, you can say it's really very valuable to have these very quantitative benchmarks that we can say, okay, can we do this and we can at least do something. Uh, it's of course also important to realize that this is just a very first step. Uh, there has to be something beyond both on same quantum algorithm demonstration to warrant the, the actual engineering effort going into to all the demonstrations, uh, explicit demonstrations of that. And I think in the last part of the talk, I'll, I'll say something about some of the opportunities that we foresee for the hardware we're developing. It's also becoming commercial. So, so uh, this is a company that we started uh, already some years ago now called Sparrow Quantum that actually commercializes sells these single photon chips. Uh, so, and if you're interested in, in purchasing one, uh, they are available. And then uh, this is my summary slide of the single photon part of, of my talk. I think uh, they start to look pretty streamlined and pretty, pretty uh, shiny. Um, they have very good specs, but of course there's a, there's a backside to, to everything. So only to get these very good specs, you have to have stuff under control. So they're phonons, they're random wavelengths and nuclear spin paths, they're all these things that you that, that you really, really that drawbacks of, of the platform uh, that you either need to control like what we did to, to get to these very uh, high uh, performance demonstrations here or work around one way or the other and some of the more advanced applications I will talk about now actually tries to work around you can say these Achilles heels of the of the platform uh, and and I think that's a general message also in quantum technology I mean you you have your qubits, it has some pros and some cons, and, and you try to also tailor your application to what you are good at on your platform and avoid what you're less good at. So quantum dots are very good at emitting many photons, and that was the message so far. Um, and, uh, and now we will then add something more uh, to the toolbox. Now we'll actually introduce a spin inside the quantum dot. And, uh, and again, we can we can nicely manipulate the spin by uh, optical excitations beams from, from the top of these structures here. And otherwise the devices are the same, it's these photonic crystal structures that we can do experiments on. Now we just can optically control a spin inside the corner block. So the level structure you see over here now, we have four levels, uh, uh, four levels. We have a spin up and a spin down. And now we can start to optically pump the, the, the spin into to one of those uh, ground states. And of course, you need to have a sufficiently long T1 time that you can actually do the spin pumping. And you have to develop it all in the nanostructures. That's always a, an added complexity that, that when you want to do all this in the nanostructures. Uh, and so we've been working on this uh, for some years and really get good uh, 
preparation fidelities and so on in the nanostructures as well. So now we really can really set out to, to start to do uh, advanced protocols and one protocol that is very well suited to the, to the hardware here is, uh, well, a protocol put forward originally by Linda and Rudolf uh, to generate uh, multi-photon entangled states uh, on demand. So that really exploits what the quantums are good, good at, emitting many photons quickly before your system, in this case, your spin decoheres. So now you have a finite spin coherence time. It's about microsecond time scales because it's a T2 time uh, that, that matters because of spin echo in this, uh, in this particular protocol I'm looking at. So, uh, but, and the emission time for these quantum lots would be a typical time would be 100 picoseconds. So you see, I can really emit many photons within the spin coherence time and really think of, of producing long entangled states. So the idea is the following, that you are exciting and emitting on a cycling transition that you're seeing here. You're encoding the photons in time bin. Uh, uh, you're doing time bin encoding, so photon emitted either in an early or a late time bin. And then in between uh, excitation emission events uh, and between early and late time bins, you're doing spin rotations on the spin ground states here between spin up and spin two, spin up and spin down. So here's a pulse sequence, sequence that will actually produce an n qubit uh, DHC state or an n qubit cluster state, depending on exactly what spin rotations you're doing. Uh, so this is all just a spin preparation, and this is just a sequence of exciting emitting uh, in an early time bin, doing a pi rotation on the spin, exciting emitting in a late time bin, doing another rotation on the spin, repeating that sequence in, in time. That produces a cluster state or a GHC state, for instance, like shown here. If the spin was up, uh, photon one and two and three and four, they were all emitted in the early time bin. If the spin was pointing up, all the photons were emitted in the late time bin. Um, and nice and simple, it looks. And uh, uh, But of course, there are quite some, some, some things that you'll have to look into in terms of, of real imperfections uh, in a real experimental system. So this is what we have been evaluating and really uh, trying to answer the questions of how well or how much can I scale the system up taking all imperfections into account. So that's a nice collaboration with my colleague Anna Sørensen at the Niels Bohr Institute. So here's the, the structure again, it's a photonic crystal waveguide. You have the level structure that you see here and we are calculating the fidelity of the in photon entangled state that's generated as a function of number of photons, taking into account the relevant experimental imperfections. So one is a photon indistinguishability that we talked about already. Uh, another one is that, uh, okay, I have a free level system that I want to operate on. I'm exciting and mating on this transition. I'm optically driving uh, uh, spin or Raman pulses between uh, those two uh, spin states here. But there's a fourth level here, and I can accidentally start to populate that. So I need to detune that significantly away. And then finally, there's a branching ratio, uh, B here, and that is the probability to decay on this cycling transition relative to decaying on the other transition where that will give rise to an error in my entangled state. Uh, so you want this branching ratio to be very large. You don't want it to be infinite because you, don't, you still want to have this transition available because that's what I'm using when I'm driving these Raman transition here. I need both to be able to do cycling transitions and optical Raman pulses simultaneously. And actually the nanostructure uh, is, is a nice advantage there because uh, the nanostructure has an inherent symmetry between uh, um, those two dipoles. They would be, uh, there would be a transverse dipole here, uh, transversely along the, uh, transverse to the waveguide here. And this dipole will be longitudinal uh, to the waveguide. And the ratio between the, the decay rates for those two, I mean, the transverse one is enhanced by Purcell enhancement. The other one is suppressed by the photonic band gap. So that actually gives a very large branching rate, 50, but maybe even 100. That is a major advantage for this protocol. So here we have calculated this infidelity as a function of number of photons. And you see, you know, I can get like 16% infidelity. So that corresponds to 1.6% error per photon. Uh, uh, plotted out here to, to up to 10 photons. And interestingly, actually these values start to approach the threshold for if you uh, are generating uh, or would do measurement based fault tolerant quantum computing on two and three dimensional photonic cluster states. So we're starting to get uh, a predict uh, values that, that look promising. 
So uh, this is just really fresh data from the lab of the actual experimental demonstration of these uh, spin photon uh, time bin encoded entanglement. This is so far just a single spin and a single photon, and we are starting to to yeah, well see these correlations between the spin up and late uh, time bin photon and, and vice versa, and we measure them in a, in a different uh, basis here and can extract the entanglement fidelity of 67% uh, larger than, than the entanglement bound of 50%. And uh, very much in progress, and this is just a very first experiment, so improving this experiment, doing this error analysis, and of course scaling it up to multiple qubits. So where is this all going? Well, um, one uh, application of this is uh, quantum computing. So that's one way uh, quantum computing. Uh, that is an approach to do quantum computing where uh, you start by producing a two-dimensional photonic cluster state. And then what you have to do on that is just single qubit um, measurements on this large-scale entangled state that is encoding uh, your actual uh, algorithm, how you're measuring on the state. And that's a, a proposal again from, from Rudolf of uh, actually that, that having free photon DHC states of sufficiently high equality, um, you, can, you can grow a universal photonic cluster state only by linear optics and, and totally ballistically just send these free photon cluster states or GSC states through a linear optic surface and growing a, a universal cluster state. And, and, and I've shown you a, a, an efficient way of generating this, so a deterministic way of generating this free photon GSC state. That could be a major advantage compared to uh, down conversion approaches where you first need to synthesize a free photon GSC state. You first need to herald this state, and that's a probabilistic approach. Here we're generating them on demand uh, with the quantum loss. So that's one way of growing two dimensional photonic cluster states. Another is actually to start taking another emitter into the system. Uh, so um, here's a nice proposal from Sophia Gnoma saying that if I have two quantum dots and uh, where one of them is emitting the photons in 1D cluster states, the other one is doing gate operations, for instance, by a dipole dipole interaction, like, like what Ignacio was talking about, and this could be engineered by the photonic nanostructure, then you can actually start to grow deterministically higher dimensional photonic cluster states. And again, this is something that exploits what we are good at, emitting many photons quickly, um, circumvents what we're not so good at, taking many emitters. Again, unlike what Ignacio was talking about with the atoms, we take scale up, typically up by taking many emitters. That's really difficult on the quantum platform because the inhomogeneities between different quantum dots means that you know, scaling up is, is, a, is a scaling of one, two, three, four, <laughs> not uh, 10, 100,000. Um, uh, because you will need local tuning of each of those quantum dots to actually couple them to each other. So the approach here is that you take few emitter qubits, but each emitter qubit emits many, many photonic qubits. And that's kind of the scaling up that we are, the scaling up game that we are playing. That works because, again, the cooperativity or the speed effect I was talking about in the beginning is so high in our system. So then I have a final part here uh, of the presentation where I'll tell you about uh, also nonlinear optics in these systems, few photon nonlinear optics. Um, so uh, this is, again, it's the same uh, nanostructure we're working on. It's a quantum dot and photonic crystal waveguides. Um, but now I launch photons into the waveguide as opposed to exciting the quantum dot and having this quantum emitting photon. So I'm using the quantum dot as a scatterer, as a highly nonlinear scatterer. Because if these are factors one, then one photon has to scatter all of the quantum dots. If I send in a pulse, at least if it's narrow band in line width compared to the emitter line width, then it scatters off uh, the quantum dot with, with, with unity efficiency. That means if I send two photons, uh, in, I have two photons in this pulse, well, then there's an increased probability that you actually get these two photons transmitted. I mean, you get photon distortion introduced by the, by the nonlinear interaction because it simply cannot scatter both the photons simultaneously. And you'll see that if you're calculating the, uh, or, or you'll see this uh, single photon nonlinearity in operation. Um, if, you are, if you're looking at the photon statistics and transmission, that's what is calculated here, the G2, you'll see strong bunching, really meaning this preference, or think essentially that the single photon component from, from the coherent state you are, you are scattering off is reflected off the quantum dots and the two photon components are uh, preferentially uh, uh, transmitted. Uh, again, this is highly sensitive to deflation. So these things only work if you have your 
transfer, close to transform limited emission lines in the nanostructure. So here's some recent uh, experiments of, of, of these very strong extinctions that we see meaning that this coherent photon scattering uh, works very well. Uh, again, because of the, these electrically gated structures where uh, the, the, the charge noise in particular is, is, is very, very strongly reduced. And if you're looking at the, at the G2 in the transmission using this pronounced bunching effect. And you can play these tricks also with a single spin. So now uh, I, I, could, I could have a spin ground state here and I can control, I can pump the spin into a spin off state that, that actually interacts with incoming light and reflects the, 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 the light off the quantum dot. I could spin pump it into a spin down state that doesn't interact with the incoming light and lets the light through. So I can get a, an, an optical switch here where I'm controlling uh, with, uh, with just a single spin in the quantum dot whether I'm letting light through the quantum dot or whether I'm reflecting it from the quantum dot. And the most uh, recent thing we have done there is to really look further at this um, nonlinear response uh, by, by doing an experiment where we have the quantum dot here, we're sending weak coherent states through. It's a continuous wave experiment. And now we are measuring at the photon correlations both in the transmission and in the reflection. And from these data, you can extract actually the one photon response and the two photon response. So the one photon response is extracted just from the intensity, uh, uh, the spectral or the, or, the, or the frequency dependence of the intensity, and extract the, the single photon response. But from the in the G two measurements in the correlation measurements, you are you are heralding on the two photon uh, events, and you can actually extract the two photon nonlinear component from uh, the data of where if you're measuring the the, the, the G2 in the transmission, the G2 in the reflection, and also a correlation between transmission and reflection. So from that, you can, from what these data can actually reconstruct what is a two photon nonlinear uh, cross, uh, component uh, in the, in, in, again, in the continuous way uh, regime. Peter, you have five minutes to the end. Okay, perfect. Um, so where's this going? Well, um, this was a continuous experiment. Uh, now you could start to send in pulses uh, into the into the two-level system, and 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 it's a two-level emitter, so there's no spin in the system. It's just a two-level emitter, so it's nice and simple to do experiments. I don't need to con optically control a, a spin and keep that alive. I just use the quantum as a passive scatterer. But now I start to send in photon pulses, and um, and it turns out that that. Um, and there's a, there's a clever trick you can play that if you are controlling the pulse width of this pulse you're sending in and you're having a superposition of one and two photons in, in, in your pulse, then you can scatter, uh, uh, you can, you, uh, this two level scattering. I mean, the one and two photon components, as I explained, would scatter differently. The two photons will be distorted due to this fact that the quantum dot can only emit or, or scatter one photon at a time. So the two photon part will be strongly distorted by the interaction. But you can, by controlling the pulse width properly, you can actually have a control distortion so that the one and two photon components are scattered into a two orthogonal spectral temporal mode. Um, so I select the pulse width, I get one and two photon components out in orthogonal spectral temporal mode. And this has an opportunity actually because orthogonal spectral temporal modes we can select uh, in principle, and uh, for instance, Christine Silberhorn's group is working on a way to use frequency conversion to, 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 to use these spectral temporal modes as, as alphabets for, for encoding quantum information. So, uh, so if you are um, um, doing a frequency conversion where you have your quantum signal here and you have a strong pump field here, then you can select the spectral temporal mode of your pump field to match, say, the one photon component, then you're frequency converting the one photon component and you're leaving the two photon component untouched or on, uh, converted because it's an orthogonal spectral temporal mode. So with such a nonlinear conversion, you will have that a two level scattering plus a sum frequency generation would lead to one and two photons at two different frequencies. One photon will be frequency converted and the two photon components will be untouched and can just plug in a dichroic mirror and split them apart. So that's a photon sorter. That's a device, two-level scatter and a spectral temporal mode filter. That's a device that does photon sorting fully deterministically. And it turns out that this actually enables you to, for instance, construct a deterministic Bell analyzer. So a setup like this that has uh, uh, four of these uh, um, 
uh, photon sorters inside a linear object circuit will actually allow you to uh, dismissively um, uh, select uh, or determine all path encoded uh, bell states that you would send into the circuit by looking at the at coincidence patterns uh, on the detectors uh, in the setup. And you can also do some, some gate operations with, with an extension of that. But that shows you some of the, of one of the of kind of very specific opportunities that this uh, nonlinear operation, highly uh, nonlinear operation of the, of, the, of, the, of the scattering enables if you are really exploiting uh, the correlations that are induced uh, by the scattering event. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge, of course, um, the group uh, at the Niels Bohr Institute, the GPT here. I would also like to acknowledge the great collaborations we have with the uh, two groups, and particularly Arne Ludwig and Andreas Wieg's group in Bochum. They are growing all the wonderful pondot materials uh, that enables us to do this experiment, and the group of Richard Warburton, where we jointly have developed these heterostructures for this low noise. Um, uh, low, low, low charge noise, uh, nanophotonic structures. Also, thanks to my, my colleague Anna Sørensen at the Niels Bohr Institute, we are collaborating closely on all the theory. So, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Peter. Um, there is, well, I have to restrict it to one question so we stay on time. So, uh, Pablo Postigo, he asks, first of all, he says, excellent presentation, Peter. His question is, in your opinion, Peter, how much the fabrication of a quantum dot by epitaxy and so on limits the Purcell enhancement and the single photon emission rate? Yeah, so does a fabrication limit the Purcell enhancement? Um, yes, to some extent. So um, uh, I think. Um, Usually, I mean, you don't see the Purcell enhancement that you're expecting from the series. So the nanostructure should generally give much larger Purcell enhancement. Uh, and that is a fabrication uh, issue. Uh, and indeed also the, the fact that you're placing a quantum dot there can, can, can change the system a little bit. You can say that the, that's actually one of the reasons that we are looking at waveguides primarily because waveguides are very, very robust. They are very broadband and they, the reason that we have this very high beta factor is primarily because we're suppressing the coupling to unwanted modes by the photonic band gap. And that's a very robust effect. Uh, so you don't need a very strong Purcell enhancement that is more sensitive thing and is a narrow band thing that you also need to tune your quantum dot into uh, in order to really get the best out of that. Uh, so, so you can say that 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 has also been one of the reasons that, that we like the, the waveguide platforms. Uh, but you're not so sensitive to, you know, getting very, very high percent enhancement to get things to work. Okay, thank you very much. And thanks for a very clear talk and for sharing these impressive results with us. And uh, I would like to move on. Uh, our next speaker is Natasha Tom. She is with the University of Basel. And her presentation is titled A Bright and Fast Source of Coherent Single Photons. So Natasha, can you say something? Yes, can you hear Excellent. me all right? Yeah. Yes, all right, great. And can you see my screen all right as well? It looks good. Yes, okay, very good. Okay, so first of all, thank you for having me here. Um, my name is Natasha and uh, I work in the group of Richard Warburton in Basel uh, at the corner of Switzerland. And uh, as you can see, I was very uh, happy to be invited. I really wanted to from the comfort of our own office. Um, and I also really appreciate that Peter already gave a really good introduction about many of the terms I'm gonna uh, mention here. So uh, first of all, uh, why would we want single photons? Natasha, Yes. could you probably move your microphone a little bit down? Just yes. down. Is it better like this? Yeah, this is better. Yes, okay. So first I would like to give a, a little bit of motivation. So why would we want single photons? Um, of course, with the advances of quantum computing and quantum information processing, we would like to be able to do that also in the photonic regime. So for that, we would need single uh, particles of light and these are, uh, or quantum uh, particles of light. 
and these are single photons. With them, we could uh, implement several algorithms, uh, both for information processing and distribution, for example, device independent quantum key distribution, also uh, quantum simulation, such as boson sampling, uh, using linear optics, for example, and also single photon detection. And uh, as Peter has already mentioned previously as well, if you're able to entangle uh, consecutive strings of, pho of single photons, you can create these cluster states and uh, achieve universal quantum computing. What is important to mention here is that in the photonic regime, the success rate of any algorithm involving n photons scales exponentially uh, with the number of photons, but also with the, how efficiently you can create single photons. And um, a necessary condition for showing quantum advantage is that the efficiency of your photon source is at least 50%. So what is the usual approach? So two level systems are in general very good sources of single photons because of the, the two level system structure. If you excite a two level system, once the electron and the hole recombine, they will, will emit one and one only one photon with a certain um, decay rate. The problem here is that these photons tend to go everywhere. And the approach to to circumvent that is actually use an optical cavity. So the optical cavity itself also uh, allows light that is trapped inside this cavity to escape with a certain decay rate kappa, which is of course uh, inversely proportional to the quality factor of this cavity. Once you put these two things together, uh, the two level system and the cavity, they couple together. And now the, the cavity actually has a dual role in a sense. So firstly, by a de Purcell uh, effect, you actually enhance the decay rate of this, um, of this two level system, meaning that you, that you incentive photons to be emitted faster by the two level system. And this is just given by the, the amount by which you increase this uh, decay rate is just given by the Purcell factor, which of course depends on these three parameters, um, G, kappa, and gamma. Now, not only the cavity uh, makes the, um, makes the uh, two-level system emit faster, it also acts a little bit as a funnel. So you actually incentive the photons emitted by this uh, two-level system to be emitted into the mode, optical mode defined by your cavity. And this is what Peter also introduced before. This is this beta factor. So, you would imagine that if you want a very efficient source of, of single photons, you want to pump this beta factor high, right? Now, the problem is that you don't only want to create a, a photons uh, inside the cavity with a very high probability, you also want these photons to eventually escape your cavity. And this is given by this uh, new uh, uh, parameter here that we call the extraction efficiency. So now we define the quantum efficiency of the whole process of creating single photons by the multiplication of these two factors. And if you just take a look at what these factors look like, you, you would see that if you want to pump your beta up, you would have to actually decrease by, for a fixed G and gamma, you would actually have to decrease kappa. But if you decrease kappa too much, then your extraction efficiency also goes down. So actually there's a sweet, sweet spot there, some kind of Goldilocks uh, condition in which this quantum efficiency is maximized. And um, taking into account also some undesired losses in your kappa, so to say, this condition is uh, more or less around uh, 2G. But this is not the only important thing here for a very efficient single photon source. Uh, you, again, you not only want to create single photons in the cavity and make them come out of the cavity, but you have to think about your full experiment and you have to take into account that this, this efficiency that I previously described is given the condition that you have a two level system already in the excited state. So now we actually introduce two more terms to our, what, so what we call end to end efficiency. So one is this pi factor here. This is what is the probability that you excite your two level system efficiently. So the probability of a pi uh, rotation. And then also there is the probability that 
once you have a photon out of the cavity, it goes through your entire optical system out of a single mode fiber. Because in the end, you want to take this optical fiber and do your quantum simulation, whatever. So just to give you a bit of history here, I show you what were the previous state of the arts in solid state. Um, of course, parametric down conversion is, non, is a non-deterministic uh, process, but it's still, uh, in a sense, the most used technology for quantum key distribution, for example. And in terms of end-to-end -end efficiency, the record was by the group of Zhang Weipan uh, with indium arsenide in micropillars. So what is our approach? Um, thankfully, Peter also already introduced that before. So we use uh, indium arsenide uh, quantum dots in a gallium arsenide matrix, and they are gated. Uh, that means that they're um, line width uh, uh, limited. And of course, we can charge tune, so we can select which exciton we're working with, and we can control the energy of the, um, of the transition inside the quantum dot. As for the cavity, uh, we work with a slightly different uh, system than, than other groups. So we work with an open micro cavity. So this is in a sense like a really miniaturized Fabry Perot cavity where the top and the bottom mirror are, are separated. Um, the bottom mirror is a semiconductor uh, DBR uh, made of gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide. And it's highly reflective. It's much more reflective than the top mirror. And then we have the quantum dots uh, grown on top of this mirror. The top mirror is just a silica uh, chip where you ablate some kind of crater onto it, and then you have a dielectric coating. Now, the nice thing about the system is that once you shine light into it, you can, because the top and the bottom mirror are separated, you can actually move the sample around in order to bring any quantum dot in. Uh, at the center of the optical axis of your micro cavity. And also you can move the bottom mirror up and down in a sense to bring, uh, and you can reach any resonance with the cavity. So this is what we see indeed. Um, if you do a scan like this for any wavelength within the stop end of these mirrors, you can uh, find a resonance. What is very interesting here of our system is that if you zoom in in one of these resonances, you see we don't have one cavity mode, but we actually have two cavity modes. There, so the mode is actually split into two linear orthogonal polarizations. And this will actually be very important for us uh, in a minute, I'll explain why. So one very nice thing of our system is because it, is that we can actually measure absolutely every parameter in our experiment. So we start by measuring the kappa of our cavity. And indeed, uh, because the top mirror is much less reflective than the bottom mirror, we, we claim that the kappa top is actually the, or takes into account the entire kappa of the, of the, the cavity. And we measure that our extraction efficiency is 99%. Now, let me tell you a little bit also about our setup in general. So we use a cross-polarized microscope, which means that we can control, we, we can send in the nearly polarized light in one polarization and we can polarizing beam splitter, for example. Natasha, I think you were cut off for a f for probably half a minute. Oh, can you hear me yeah. now? Yeah, maybe you want to repeat what you just said. All right. So I was just saying about our cross-polarized microscope. So we use two arms of our microscope. Uh, and because of a polarizing beam splitter, we send light via one arm, so let's say via one linear polarization. We can say it's the V-polarized mode and we can collect photons that, are, that go through in the H-polarized cavity mode. The important thing here is that we use a circular transition in our quantum dot, so we can very efficiently excite this transition and via the V-polarized mode and very efficiently collect the photons that are emitted into the H-polarized cavity mode. And this way we avoid losing 50% of our single photons into the cross-polarized microscope. So let me show you how 
a usual experiment looks like. So because we have this very nice tunability, the first thing we do is we find what are the uh, resonant conditions of the transition we want to, of the quantum dot. So I think the host muted me. Can you hear me? Yes? It's fine. It's ah, fine. Okay, I got a notice. <laughs> All right. And at the same time, we can scan over the resonance of the cavity. And then we see these really nice plateaus where we have uh, many counts. Now we, we use this tunability to probe our system. So the first thing we do, oh, sorry, no, it's... so the first thing we do is we sit outside of the resonance of the cavity and we can actually measure the bulk uh, radiative lifetime of our transition. And if we sit now in the center of our resonance, so in the center of our cavity, we can measure what is the per cell enhanced lifetime of our emitter. And with this, we can actually determine our beta factor. To be honest here, to be fair, we have two cavity modes contribution to this. So if you take into account only the contribution of the cavity mode uh, in which you collect the photons, then this goes a bit down, but it's still around 90%. So we have very high beta factor and we have a very high uh, extraction efficiency. So let's see what we can get, right? So we increase the, the laser power and we see some implementation of some Rabi rotations here. And at the pi power, actually we had so many counts we had to pull the fibers apart to not saturate our detectors. But when you back calculate how much you, you attenuated your, your counts and taking into account the detection efficiency of your detectors, you actually realize that that for a laser with a repetition rate of 76 megahertz, we got around 40 million counts per second. So this is uh, this was really amazing for us. And if you realize this is actually our end-to-end -end efficiency. So this is for each trigger of our excitation, pole, uh, excitation laser, we get a 53% probability of getting a single photon out of the less optical fiber in the setup. So now we probe as well the purity of our single photons. Uh, we do this with uh, just measuring the autocorrelation function of, of uh, photons. And we measure about 2.1% um, or 90, nearly 98% purity of the single photons. Um, we also measure the indistinguishability. As Peter mentioned, this is essential also for uh, quantum advantage applications. Uh, so the raw visibility that we measure for uh, the natural repetition uh, rate of our laser is around 93%. This is the raw number. There's you, people sometimes state also the corrected number. And in this case, uh, in our case also, it goes up to 97, 98%. But what is really special about a system and in partly is also because of the gate, gating of the, these quantum dots is that our indistinguishability is not only very high at uh, low time delays, but uh, up to 1.5 microseconds and probably even higher. Unfortunately, we couldn't measure at higher time delays. And given that we can produce a photon every nanosecond, this means that you have thousands of photons that are uh, indistinguishable uh, relative to each other. So, this was all very nice, but we wanted to make sure that we didn't just have a lucky shot there. So of course we repeated our experiment uh, with other quantum dots and they all have intrinsically the same values of uh, single photon purity and uh, uh, photon indistinguishability. And the end-to-end -end efficiency of all these uh, obtained with all these quantum dots were actually between 53 and 57%, um, which was indeed very nice. So with this, I am approaching the co conclusion of my talk. I would just like to compare again to the previous state of the art. So we have intrinsically the same values of single photon purity and hum visibility as other solid state uh, systems. But now we have more than double the end-to-end -end efficiency as previous single photon sources. And um, 
this is very nice. And if you remember at the beginning of my talk, I, I mentioned that uh, efficiency of production of single photons of at least 50% is a necessary condition for quantum advantage. And I'm happy to say that now we have crossed this line. So I'm excited to see what comes next. And finally, as a small outlook, I would just like to say that with the same system without much modification, we can do uh, further uh, very interesting experiments. So we have now achieved a very efficient single photon source, but of course uh, we, we can put the spin at the game and in, um, achieve some spin photon entanglement. If we're able to entangle consecutive photons with the spin that, it, that remains in there, we can create a cluster state source and uh, just by operating exactly the same system in a slightly different regime, we can actually um, create a single photon transistor or diode. And in fact, uh, we have done that. And I encourage you to visit the poster of my colleague, Nadia Antoniadis. She will talk about this uh, single photon transistor in her talk on Thursday, or oh, sorry, on her poster on Thursday. And also visit the poster of my colleague, Elisa Javadi. He will also talk about probing nonlinearities with this system. So with this, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, my professor Richard for the great opportunity of working in this project. And also my, the colleagues who worked with me in this project, Elisa, Nadia, and Daniel. And um, also our collaborators at the University of Bochum who provided us with a very nice uh, semiconductor sample. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, this is very wonderful work. Um, and the first question starts exactly with this statement. Very impressive work. I am wondering, and this is by Alex Clark, I am wondering about the polarization splitting. What causes it? And would you like to have more or less? Can you engineer it? Yes. Uh, thanks. Um, so yes, the, the mode splitting arises from some birefringence in the semiconductor material. Um, it's hard to say exactly what is the source of this birefringence, uh, but we know it's in semiconductor material. We actually have just submitted uh, some work on that as well uh, recently. And yes, you can you can engineer it. Um, you can, for example, we soon hopefully will be out. We have uh, placed a sample in a strain tuning uh, piezo, and then you can actually increase or decrease the, the mode splitting of these cavities. I should mention also that across the sample, the, the mode splitting is different. So for different positions, you have different mode splitting. There's another question. Unfortunately, I don't know the name. So I would like to um, remind everybody to uh, use your name as your Zoom name so we know who you are. But anyway, the question is, how would it be possible to integrate your structure into a single mode waveguide of a photonic circuit? Um, I think that's not the main idea. Um, I think the idea is, I mean, just like uh, top, top of the table lasers, uh, the single, this specific structure is not to be operated like this. Of course, you can integrate, you can then use different structures like photonic crystal structures or uh, bullseyes uh, structures to have it really everything on chip if, if, uh, if that's the, the case. I think this was not the, this is not the strong point of this structure actually. Not for uh, like full on chip uh, integration. So since you generous, generously left um, sufficient time for questions, I will ask one. I wonder about the metric for indistinguishability. Um, somehow it is implicit that it's the visibility of the Hong U Mandel dip. But um, if this makes sense if I have two photons, no? But uh, if, if I now have like, you know, in Peter's talk, I have like 60 or 100, okay, indistinguishable photons. How do I test this? Is this a pairwise test always? If one and two are indistinguishable and two and three is then also one and three indistinguishable. So, so what's, what's, what's the rule of this in this game as you scale it up a system? 
um, in regards to indistinguishability? Yes, so this is actually the question of Boson sampling, right? This is really the question of what, ha because in this, uh, in the Hongomandel experiment, what, what you're probing is actually whether the modes after the, this beam splitter are entangled. You're not, it's nothing that the photons are entangled, right? And this is actually something that would need to be simulated. Of course, you have an analytic answer to this question for maybe three photons. What happens if three photons reach uh, a, a linear optic uh, uh, setup? But of course, as soon as you start scaling it to 60, 80, many photons, then this is a problem that we cannot answer anymore without actually doing the experiment. And because this is just solving this unitary matrix, which is your linear optic setup, right? So actually the answer to this question is you have to go into the lab, place a hundred photons in there, and then you can back calculate what is your unitary transformation in your, in your experiment. Um, but I, I believe, I mean, for three photons, it, I think it's also a dip. I don't know if, I'm not sure if it goes to zero. So that's, that's my answer. Okay, wonderful. So I would like to end it here. Uh, thank you, Natasha, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we move to the fourth talk of this session. This is by Wen, Wen, I, I, I'm not sure, Wen Chen, no? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I see you over there. Excellent. So take it away from here. Yeah, so can you see the screen? Yes, um, everything shows perfectly. Okay, good. So hello everyone. So my name is Wen Chen. So I'm, I'm from EPLPL Switzerland. So now I'm working as a postdoc in Christoph Gallen's group. And uh, now I'm, to go, I'm going to discuss about the intrinsic luminescence blinking from plasmonic nanojunction. And uh, as we know, one of the central topics in the era of nanophotonics is to realize the control of the enhanced dead matter interaction at the nanoscale. So plasmonic nanocavity is served as a powerful platform to achieve that. So it generally consists of two metal nanostructures approaching each other with separation near one or few nanometer. So based on the plasmonic resonance effect, the far field light can be effectively confined inside such nanogap region. So this results in a largely enhanced optical process of nanoemitters placed inside the nanocavity. So by coupling, the, by coupling different types of emitters with, plas, uh, with plasmonic nanocavities, various novel phenomena and advanced applications has have been achieved, including the single molecule spectroscopy, the enhanced single photon source, and even the strong coupling effect with single emitter. And however, in many of these studies, the plasmonic nanocavity is on the classical or simplified view, where the metal surface is treated as a, a cavity mirror without considering the activities of surface atoms. So recently, it was proposed that the instability of single or few atoms on the metal surface can be treated as a, a pico cavity, so called, with ultra small volume or model volume which can strongly modify the optical properties of the nearby emitters and their coupling effects with plasmonic nanocavities. So this is considered as the uh, possible origin of some important applications, such as the, the achievement of super resolution Raman image. And furthermore, it was demonstrated that the metal nanocluster with magic atom numbers is actually a type of quantum confined in the emitter. So this metal quantum dot, which is a potential single photon source, can not only be fabricated by the chemical synthesis, but can also be generated from the metal surface by light excitation. So on the other hand, also the low, also the low quantum yield, some metals like gold is actually a luminescent material, which also makes the metal surface more than as a cavity mirror. The figure in the middle shows the band structure of gold. The intrinsic light emission of gold film can be explained as different mechanisms, such as the electronic Raman scattering process and the interband or intraband transition, depending on the energy of the incident light. So for, for the gold nanostructures, 
the luminescence intensity is largely enhanced by the Purcell effect of the plasmodic resonators. And the broadband emission is reshaped following the local density of state of the metal cavities. So this means that the PL from the gold resonator itself is a good probe to investigate the plasmodic response. So the, the metal PL is also considered as an unavoidable background from some spectroscopic studies, such as the Raman spectrum. So further understand the metal form lessons can facilitate the reliable and the precise analysis for the optical signal. So furthermore, the metal PR and its coupling with plasmonic nano cavities are associated with the hot carrier generation, which have some important applications such as photocatalysis, light harvesting, and energy conversion. Overall, so we can see that the dynamic properties at the boundary between the atoms, the nanocluster, the nanoparticle, and the metal surface are linked to some new research area and the potential novel applications, but still poorly understood. So these are the main motivation of why we want to further investigate the intrinsic volume lessons from the metal. And to well investigate the intrinsic gold volume lessons, we fabricate the plasmodic nano junction with the nano particle or mirror geometry, where the plasmodic response and the field enhancement in the gap can be well controlled by tuning the thickness of the spacer and the size of a nano particle. So to obtain the high quality cavity, we use two methods to get an atomic smooth gold film. And for the fabrication of spacer, we choose either various molecules with different assembly or grow a dielectric layer or, depth, or even depth the a 2D material on, on top of gold film. But in the end, by drop casting different types of nanoparticles, we can obtain more than 20 types of nanojunctions for the investigation of the gold film lessons. And for the optical measurement, we established a, a, a custom setup with three main functions. First, we used green laser to measure the PL from interband inter transition. Second, a wavelength tunable red laser was introduced for the measurement of plasma enhanced Raman scattering. Finally, we, we used the white light luminescent from the side of the sample to form a dark field scattering configuration, which allows us to observe the plasmodic response. So the result is shown figure in the figures in the middle. So as expected, the photoluminescence from net junctions shows a large Purcell enhancement with the spectral profile follows its plasmodic response with several different gap modes. So notice that here, the exposure time of photon lessons is 10 seconds, which is a long that is it's pretty long that may average the dynamics effect of photon lessons. And when reducing the exposure time to 0 0.1 second, we surprisingly found that the metal photon lesson is strongly blinking over time. So let me start this video so you can clearly see the evolution of photon lessons. So this PL blinking behave as a temporary increase intensity over a constant baseline PL error. And sometimes along with a wandering peak position and a narrowing peak line width. So notice that although the peak position appearing narrow peaks looks pretty random, but they rarely exceed the plasmodic resonant region like the 700 nanometer. And based on the further analysis, we, we found that the blinking from different gap modes are independent in terms of the intensity and the peak position. But there is a, a clear positive correlation between the peak intensity and the line, line width. So to understand this phenomenon, we can divide the origin of metal uh, photodome lessons into the electronic part and the photonic parts. The first, the intrinsic emission of gold is determined by the band structure, carrier dynamics, and the relaxation pathways. And the broadband emission is then coupled, coupled to the plasmonic nano junction to form Purcell enhanced photoluminescence. So there must be at least one of them changed to cause the PL blinking. So let's first check if the near field enhancement and, and L dose in the gap if is changed during the blinking. 
So to check that, we perform the simultaneous Raman and PL measurement, where the green laser is used to excite the PL and the red laser is used to obtain uh, the plasma enhanced Raman signal to monitor the near field enhancement in the gap. As a result, we can see that the PL is blinking while the Raman spectrum remains stable. This means that the blinking is very unlikely caused by the change of the Purcell enhancement. And then so come back to the checklist. And we also need to check if the plasmonic resonance is changed due to the variation of the shape of the net junction and the laser illumination. So in this regard, we perform the simultaneous dark field and photoluminescent measurement. Well, the elastic dark field scattering is served as a sensitive probe of a plasmodic re response. In the end, we found that we can obtain a strongly blinking photoluminescence with extremely stable dark field spectrum over time. So this observation can be further um, demonstrated by a real-time image shown in the video. So here, for the, in the, the nano junction in the bottom, excited by green laser, shows uh, strongly blinking while the, the other net junction on top shows a stable dark field image. So now we have almost excluded all the global changes of optical response in the net gap region. Then we need to draw attention to the pos possible change of the metal itself, such as change of the band structures. So inspired by the concept of the emitting metal, metal cluster from the literature, we propose that the PR blinking can be explained as a transient generation of metal quantum emitters, which is associated with the re rearrangement of gold atom surface. So this quantum emitter is induced at the metal interface very locally, which explains why there is no impact on the plasmodic response and the near field enhancement in the gap. So next, this fluctuation local emission is coupled, coupled to the nano junction to form Purcell enhanced photoluminescence. This second step explains why we almost do not observe any strong peak appearing out of the resonance region, such as 700 nanometer. So our next interest is to understand what is the trigger for the transient formation of the local metal emitters. So first, we measure time resolved photoluminescence intensity trace using a single photon counting module by changing the sample temperature from room temperature to 4 Kelvin. So interestingly, we found that the PR can still show strong blinking events at 4 Kelvin, which almost exclude any thermal effect to induce the formation of the local emitters. So note that we can also exclude the laser heating effect as we only use a weak continuous wave laser for the excitation, where the increase of the temperature is only few Kelvin at most. But uh, on the contrary, we found a clear positive correlation between the laser power intensity and the, and the blinking occurrence. So this suggests that the PR blinking is induced by a non thermal but optically activated source. In this case, the possible origin is limited where well, the hot carriers with high electron temperature should play an important role on it. So from the result, additionally, from the result of the excitation wavelength dependent, we find more evidence to support our assumption. So compared with the 785 nanometer excitation, which can only support the intraband transition, the indirect intraband transition, the green laser excitation via well, interband transition is more efficient for the generation of hot carrier. Thereby, we can see more pronounced PR blinking by green laser excitation. And finally, we also make a comparison of plasmodic metal junction with different uh, compositions, including the space uh, materials, the shape of metal particle, and the crystal quality of the metal. For instance, so if the gap, metal gap is formed by a dielectric spacer, we can still observe the blinking, but it is much less pronounced compared with the case of using molecule spacer. This suggests that the blinking is strongly influenced by the spacer material and the surface chemistry at the metal interface, which links to the instability of the surface atom. And uh, 
The presence of the molecule may also change the electron density via charge transfer effect, but this needs to be further demonstrated. So I like to take a, a brief summary. So we investigate the intrinsic photomolecular blinking from the plasmodium nanotube junction with various compositions, and we found that the, the blinking is not caused by the change of by the change of plasmodium re response and the Purcell enhancement. We propose the model that this blinking can be caused by the transient generating of metal quantum emitters linking to the re re rearrangement of gold atom surface. The fluctuating local emission is then coupled to the plasmodium nanotube cavity to form Purcell enhanced PL. We also demonstrate that the blinking is triggered by a no thermal but optical activated source related to the hot carrier generation. So finally, we found a positive correlation between the blinking occurrence and the metal surface chemistry. Also, we still don't have a comprehensive picture to prove or disprove all the possible effects, but at least we provide some new insight of this blinking that is distinctive from the previous report. So moreover, our results can cause some interest in open questions, such as if we can use the intrinsic PL to understand the dynamics of the hot carriers, this should be available for many photochemistry applications. On the other hand, if the PR blinking is really caused by the metal quantum emitters, could we further investigate, investigate their quantum nature and even find a way to control the blinking so we can make that the potential life source? At last, so as I'd like to thank for the support from my professor, the group member, and the collaborator, and all the related companies. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So I go to my chat thing and so far no questions. So I start with my questions. Okay. Um, so your hypothesis is that it's the gold clusters that generate the luminescence and it's just amplified by, by the Purcell enhancement. Yes. Now, I, I wonder you know, whether you could do some control experiments to, mm -hmm. to somehow uh, make this um, claim more solid. I mean, you you took here, um, you said an atomically flat gold surface. It's atomically flat, but it's not single crystalline. It's actually polycrystalline. So what if you chose a single crystalline surface, which can be fabricated? Um, uh, would you expect the same effect that these clusters would form? Actually, I think the the geometry with single uh, crystalline flake is is already in our fabrication. As you can see, this so we use the chemical synthesis method to fabricate the single micro flake at the gold film. Uh, I missed this. So so it is not not so you use both both. Um, yes, I use the other yeah possible materials. And with okay, then go spaces. then going the other uh, direction. Yeah, I mean, you you can also um, uh, with a cluster source, you can generate a clusters of gold. And uh, so can you prepare a, a surface, a gold surface that is decorated with clusters and see much more blinking? Uh, yes, I think this is interesting, but I don't know. Um, but I'm not sure if this there is a big difference between this type of surface uh, with the rough surface. Because in this case, it's really hard because after the laser illumination, then I think the surface become pretty activated. So yeah, this I think this is pretty pronounced in the silver materials. There are a lot of uh, reports from the silver film, even the clean silver film, you can observe very really strong PR blinking. But I, I would emphasize that this is a really different story compared to the gold because silver is really a photochemistry active material it can really react react with the environment and then the situation becomes more complex compared to the gold so the gold is is relatively more stable so that's why this observation is it's really different compared with silver system okay so i go on here with questions that have been posted by the audience so the first one is by frank coppins so he says, I can see that the particle can be a plasmonic cavity, 
but I'm wondering about the hotspot of metal corrugation. Why is it called a cavity? A cavity is something like a resonator. What is the resonance for a pico cavity? Uh, so for the pico cavity, it's a different story. So if we, for example, if we use the fabricated nano cavity with a nanoparticle mirror geometry, so then this metal film is treated as a mirror. So it generates the, the mag magnetic, uh, electromagnetic mirror of the net of the low gold net particle on top. So this is really similar to the uh, geometry of uh, gold diamonds. And for the pure cavity events, I think it's really some uh, protrusion generated on the surface. So this this uh, shows an extremely light confinement, but it is a really almost a broadband. Uh, I, I don't think that it shows a very sharp, any sharp resonance because due to this uh, future of extremely light confinement. So, so, so actually for this field of pure cavity is really a new field. So I think the understanding of the coupling, pure cavity coupling with the traditional nano cavity is really an uh, open question. Mm -hmm. So then we have a comment, uh, not a question by Manuel Gonzalez. Um, and he says, strong photoluminescence, also blinking, happens on surface substrates when coated with some molecules, sometimes mm. carbon-based uh, species. Do you yeah. see here a connection to your observation? Yeah. That is yes. my question. He, he posted the comment, but I, I, I make a question out of that. Yes, that's the that's the people generally will ask what's the difference uh, between our observation and the third fluctuation observed before. So the very very uh, first important uh, difference is that we did the careful uh, experiment to exclude all the possibility from the fluctuation of field enhancement in the gap. I think if we demonstrate that the, there is no change of the of the plasmodal response and the field enhancement, then we probably exclude most of the possibility observed before. Because for the third fluctuation, it's really easy to find the, uh, it's ready to, they really didn't do any uh, well-defined control experiment to guarantee that there is no change of the field enhancement. And also if you see, already see the fluctuation of Raman, then it's really hard to distinguish about the change of the field enhancement and other effect. So in our case, we observe that the PL, the Rama and the dark field are, all sta are both stable. So in this case, we should exclude all the global effect. So I think, so based on a lot of uh, discussion, we saw that the only possibility is that there is a emitter generated very locally. We are not 100% sure if it's a content emitter, but at least we can show that only something generated very locally can explain why there is no impact on the or the field enhancement change and the change of the primary response in the gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that blends into the next uh, question. Yeah. So your hypothesis is, uh, you know, that uh, or you advocate that, that these are gold clusters. Yeah. And Javier Aispurua says. You know, you, I guess you cannot discard some other source of inhomogeneity um, in the metal surface. This can be atomic or add layer melted areas. So the evidence is that there is an electronic inhomogeneous structure, but the actual structure could be quite unknown. Would you yeah. agree with this I'll or is there very strong evidence for the uh, gold cluster hypothesis? Um, I agree with that. It's really we really don't understand what's the microscopy uh, origin of of the what's going on in the nano gap. So I think, and also I think this is uh, people may think that this effect is very similar with the pure cavity events, but the pure cavity is really impact the intensity of the Raman scattering. But in our case, we also observe the PL blinking, but at the same time with the uh, pure cavity enhanced uh, Raman events, and they are totally independent. They can show at the same time, but there, there is no correlation between these two effects. Okay, so we are, we are, we are 
right on time, but I still um, read the next question. This is Martin Woops, mm -hmm. and he asks whether you have an idea about the upper size of this, uh, these gold clusters. Are we talking here two atoms, three atoms, or is it, you know, a nanoparticle? Yes, so I think they uh, already have some research about if you only have two atoms, you have already have a chance to to treat this as a, a emit, strongly emitting quantum dose. And the, but this is mainly synthesized by some chemical method and the, the surface was protected by the, some ligands molecules. And then you can really treat this as a quantum dose similar with the semiconductor quantum dose. And then if you, but when if you increase the number of the atoms, then you can, you can get the decreased quantum yield Due to the due to if, if you make the, the band structure becomes more complex, and then the radiative recombination, the chance of this process becomes le much less compared to the cluster with only few atoms. Okay, there are more comments and questions. I leave it here. Maybe you can yeah. um, 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 yes, check okay. the, the, the chat just for the sake of our coffee break. We're yeah. almost on time, only two minutes over and we will reconvene in 13 minutes so quarter past five so have a good coffee break yes, see you all you much. later yeah
Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Hello. Can you hear me? It's like a semiconductor chip that you can see in this image here. If you zoom in, you see this kind of wheel shaped structure, which are actually optical cavities. I will explain that later. And at the center of this cavity, we have a single quantum dot, which acts as a single photon emitter. So we are interested. In we are interested in uh, developing quantum light sources, quantum light uh, devices for uh, quantum applications. And uh, in this uh, context, we are inter interested in discrete variables. So we mean that uh, we work, we are trying to develop the ideal single photon source. It would be a device that develops, delivers light pulses. Each pulse would contain exactly one photon and no more, no more less. However, in a realistic world, there is always a probability to lose the photon. So in practice, we will never have a 100% probability to have one photon per pulse. So one metric for these sources is the probability to have one photon per pulse, which we call the brightness. For most, most applications, uh, we need also indistinguishable photons. Photons that when they, are in, they impede on the beam speaker, because they are completely identical, quantum physics tells us that they will exist together, not separately, always together by other parts of the beam speaker. We need that for most uh, quantum applications to do photon-photon gain. So let me first present our uh, technology, our quantum light sources. So we work with semiconductor quantum dots. They are standard, old-fashioned, indium gallium arsenide quantum dots and gallium arsenide barriers, which have been shown to emit single photons in the early 2000s. We insert these quantum dots in cavities to implement cavity quantum electrodynamics. So here in our case, we put the dot in the micropillar cavity. It's made of two Bragg mirrors, which confine light in the lambda cavity here in the vertical direction. And in the transverse direction, because it has a similar shape fiber, you also have light confinement because of total eternal reflection. Overall, we confine light in the three directions and our single quantum dot is very well coupled to a one cavity mode. Uh, we operate in the weak uh, coupling regime where we accelerate the spontaneous emission by a factor F, the Purcell factor, which means that um, the probability for the quantum dot to emit a photon into the cavity mode is given by beta, which is above Fp divided by Fp plus one. Then we want the photon to escape the, uh, the source through the top of the micropillar where we can collect them in the first uh, collecting apparatus, like um, an objective, a microscope objective, and this output coupling efficiency we call eta top, and both uh, will define the efficiency of the device we can make. You may know that quantum dots, uh, in young gallium arsenide quantum dots, are uh, when they naturally grow, they have random position. So to actually um, fabricate this kind of devices, we developed uh, more than 12 years ago now, a technique which is called in situ radiography, which allows us to position the quantum dot exactly where we want in the micropillar and to tune the parameters of both the quantum dot and the micropillar to have a spectral matching between the two. Combining these various ingredients, back in 2013, we were able to obtain uh, the brightest single photon source uh, so far uh, with a probability to collect the photon per first here on top of the micropillar around 80%. But this is not enough for quantum uh, technologies. We also need single photon which are indistinguishable. So we can write this in this uh, formalism of the catch uh, one here impeding on the beam splitter just by taking the matrix of the beam splitter. You have four possibilities for the output and these two uh, middle for, uh, possibilities here cancel out. We have a plus and minus sign here. But what do I mean by this one photon fog state here? Actually, it's a pulsed single photon source, which means that we have a, a frequency spectrum for our single photon. So what I mean here is actually I have one photon in, in a mode and this mode is defined by the superposition of different photon state, fog state of one with different frequency omega with well-defined coefficients here, which I note T. And these coefficients are complex number with a total modulus square equal to one. This is what I really want to create, a pure quantum state, not a statistical mixture, a pure quantum state with one photon into that mode that I define with these parameters here. What does it mean for my quantum system? It means that I want that my uh, quantum emitter emits a photon uh, in a circumstance where it has uh, only uh, uh, experienced a new unitary evolution, a reversible uh, evolution until it emits a photon. This is a condition to have pure uh, quantum state emission. And this is of course very demanding if you think of doing that with a solid state emitter, uh, because uh, now we have uh, different problems that can come in. First, you can have charge noise uh, around your quantum dot. 
And this is why we changed the technology uh, a little bit to make these micropillars into this wheel shape here. We have now the quantum dot in the micropillar, but we also have 1D ridges, which connect to a bigger frame where we can define the electrical contact. And the quantum dot is now inserted in the diode structure where we can sweep away the charges away from the quantum dot by applying the bias. The second ingredient is to control fully the, the, the way we uh, put the quantum dot into the excited state. The most uh, obvious way to do that is to use coherent control, which means use a laser at the same uh, frequencies as the quantum dot to excite the quantum dot from the ground to this excited state. And these are these Rabi oscillations that you can now observe in our system. The last ingredient uh, is to reduce the effect of phonon decoherence. So for that, we, uh, we found out a few years ago that when we put the quantum dot in the cavity, actually we can very much change the ratio between the emission into the zero phonon line and the phonon sideband for the quantum dot. This is what you can see here. By putting the zero phonon line of a quantum dot emission resonant into the cavity mode, we can strongly suppress the fraction of emission into the phonon sideband simply because we accelerate the emission into the zero phonon line. By gathering all this, we were able in 2016 to uh, obtain a new generation of quantum light sources that we published in this paper in 2016 together with a similar result from the group of Chai Lu in China. Here on this map, you can have some kind of summary of what we achieved. On the x-axis, you have indistinguishability, which should be as close to one as possible. And in the vertical axis, in log scale, we need uh, the a brightness as close to one as possible. So the ideal source is, is, is in this right upper corner here. What we obtained in 2016 is a factor of 10 increase with respect to the more traditionally used quantum sources for quantum technology, the sources based on parametric down conversion, which work on frequency generation of photon pairs and heralding one photon of the pair. These sources are very nice, but they operate only at very low efficiency. And this is an interesting limitation. So the quantum dot community, and here you have other references, and if you want to know more, there, are this, there is this review paper in Nature Nanotechnology, gain a factor of more than 10 increase uh, for a probability to get a, a pure photon, a single photon, as compared to the previous technology. And if you consider using this photon for, for instance, quantum computation, with n photon, it's a 10 power to the n increase uh, of this possibility. So actually, these kind of sources have been uh, very rapidly used to uh, boost uh, optical quantum computing. And the most uh, important work uh, reported so far was done in the group of Chai Yang Lu, where they uh, managed to do a intermediate scale quantum computing scheme, which is called boson sampling with 20 input photons. The previous state of the art was uh, five photons. OK, so in this talk now, I want first to address how we can uh, go into uh, even brighter devices, how we are trying to uh, head into uh, more efficient sources toward the deterministic source. The deterministic source is the one I would have at this right upper corner here. How we go up here while keeping the high indistinguishability. So to do that, uh, there is, we need to go look into the details of what limiting our, our devices. First, the quantum dot emits a photon into a cavity mode with the probability beta that I described before. The photon escapes through the cavity to the top with the eta top parameter here. But of course, the source is determined by the probability of having a dot in, the, in its excited state, so the quantum dot occupancy. And for most applications, we also want photons that are linearly polarized, or at least that have a very well-defined polarization. So we also introduce here the degree of polarization. All this defines the first lens brightness of our devices. Now, if you want to give these sources to someone to do some quantum computation, we want to put them in a fiber. So there is also the setup efficiency that we need to optimize to have a very efficient fiber brightness. So let's look at what was limiting our previous demonstration. What, like I said, to have a highly distinguishable photon, we need to do resonant excitation, which means that we excite the emitter at the same frequency, uh, the same frequency as the, the, the frequency of the photon, single photons we want to collect. So we need to get rid of the laser, and it's not so easy to do so. So the most, if, um, the most uh, obvious way to do that is to use a cross polarization scheme. You excite the device with some polarization and collect in the cross polarization. The best system, the brightest source you can get with this kind of system is based on a charged quantum dot, a quantum dot where we have a carrier. Because in this case, the carrier can have two spin states here, and we are, we are playing actually with a four-level system with this following optical selection rule. 
you see that here I can excite with V polarization and collect in H polarization, and I can get a nice single photon here. The price to pay is that the degree of polarization, uh, the, the source is unpolarized, so the, the polarization degree that I will get with my polarizer is below 50%. So this is an intrinsic limitation of this thing. To go around that, a first solution was proposed again in the group of Chai Longbo in 2019, was to use uh, birefringent cavities, cavities like uh, elliptical macropillars, where you can have a, a polarization splitting of the mode. And now you can put your emitter in resonance in, with a, just a one mode, cavity mode, with a well-defined polarization. By doing that, basically what has been done is that you implement a, um, a polarized personal effect, a faster acceleration of continuous emission in H than in V. And by doing so, they managed to increase the first lens brightness above uh, the uh, limitation of 50% of the, all the parameters, and they managed to reach 60%. Even better, recently, in the group of Richard Robertson, they use exactly the same scheme with an open cavity system, but now they also optimize the setup efficiency, and they managed to obtain a fibroid brightness of 53%. So what we have done on our side is to uh, uh, use a different approach, and I will explain why later, to uh, head towards this uh, deterministic thing. What we do is go back to solid state physics. We exploit the natural asymmetries of the quantum dot, and actually we will exploit phonons and gain a factor of two efficiency. So what we will do is use a naturally polarized single photon source. Actually, the quantum dot, when there is no charge in the system, there is, they have a very interesting um, stru level structure where you have the ground state and two excited states. And because there is some uh, asymmetry in the system, the two excited states are split and they are equivalent to a linearly polarized dipole. So the objective here is just to use one of these dipoles and have naturally 100% polarized single photon. The problem, of course, is that now you cannot excite and collect at the same wavelength using polarization rejection. So what we do, is that we introduce now phonon assisted excitation scheme. So we slightly detune the laser on the blue side of our transition to excite and collect in the same polarization. So this is what we do here. We excite in X, we collect in X or Y, and you see that we have a single photon source spectrum here, very high intensity as compared to Y, showing a degree of polarization very close to one. And actually on paper, this approach can lead to a polarization degree of one. Now, of course, the, the question that you may ask is, do I get a very high occupation probability of my set if I'm now using a quasi resonant excitation scheme? I'm detuned from the transition. So actually here, we rely on this beautiful theory work published a few years ago, where the um, phonon assisted excitation scheme has actually been predicted to be very interesting. The idea is that you start with your quantum dot, we excite with a detuned frequency with respect to the dot, and in the rotating frame, it means that you have two states which are separated by the frequency detuning of your laser with respect to the transition. Then you switch on the laser and you dress the state by the uh, optical stark effect. Are your two states are pushed away from each other during the when the pulse is on? And what happens is that the distance between these two states is now uh, at the right distance to have an efficient phonon emission. So the idea is that you start at uh, before the pulse with a state which is in the ground state, so quantum dot in the ground state, and then we switch on the laser, we dress the state, and during the pulse, you have a phonon emission which progressively uh, allow a high occupation probability of the excited state at the end of the pulse. So this um, scheme uh, has been, uh, expect, has been uh, predicted to allow not only a high occupation probability, it's shown here, so this is occupation probability that you can escape expect from this scheme using resonant excitation, the black curve, or phonon assisted excitation, for instance, the red curve, you see here that you can reach very high probability of having the quantum dot in the excited state very close to one. Most recently, it was shown in this paper that you can also have very indistinguishable photon using this scheme, which um, actually leads to very high indistinguishability as well. So what we did is uh, test these um, predictions on our system to uh, have this linearly polarized light that I was mentioning before with high efficiency. So what you see here is a comparison between the occupation probability that you get when you do resonant excitation, which can be close to one, and when you do this phonon-assisted excitation as a function of the pulse excitation area. 
excitation pulse area. And you see that here, we can gain very, we can obtain very high occupation probability at the level of 85% of what we would get in a uh, resonant excitation. And actually this could be further optimal. What we test after that is uh, how the brightness changes and the single photon purity, the G2 of the source is modified. So this is what you see on the left side of the, of the slide here. This is the first lens brightness for one device, uh, a device which is uh, this exciton. Well, you see that uh, under resonant excitation, we had the first lens brightness of 15%. And here on this first measurement, we have 37% um, brightness. So we gain more than a factor of two here. Then when we uh, look at the G2, the G2 of the source is very similar in both cases. And actually, what's nice is that when you use resonant phonon assisted excitation, actually, it even gets a little bit better as a function of power uh, in, in a striking contrast with what you get with resonant excitation. The minimum value of this G2 here, we found uh, theoretically that it's very, it depends very strongly on the precise shaping of the laser pulse. And so we need to work further on that to have even lower G2s here. Now, if you look at the overall performances of our devices, we, I plot here the G2 of the source, the indistinguishability of the photons, and the first lens brightness for various detunings and for various pulse duration. And you see here that we have G2 that is roughly constant, and uh, as I said before, at the level of what you get in resonant excitation here, up to uh, 20 picoseconds with indistinguishability above 92%. Uh, percent. But now you can reach brightness, which are in the 40 to 50% range, uh, well above the 10 to 20% range that it had before, exactly with the same device. So we were quite happy with this uh, result because we, we have gained a factor of two uh, in the brightness of our devices without changing anything in the device fabrication. Uh, what we like also is that it's very easy to implement. It's much easier than the cross-polarization uh, schemes where you, the rejection of the laser is very important. And most importantly for application, it's extremely robust to drift uh, because it's, uh, the brightness of the source that hardly depends on the detuning uh, of the laser with respect to the quantum dot or of the power of the laser. So it's very insensitive to all kinds of fluctuations. What we like even more is that this scheme, which doesn't rely on polarization selection, allows to you, uh, implement this, um, uh, the the scheme where you can uh, use a, a carrier in the quantum dot and uh, obtain spin photon entanglement. This is now what we are exploring in the context of uh, this fed open cluster to generate uh, untangled photon state mediated by the entanglement between the spin and the photon in the polarization discrete. In the second part of my talk, I, will to dis I want to discuss now uh, a more fundamental uh, paper that we published very recently in PRL which discussed uh, how the Hongo-Mandel interference is affected when you are interested in imperfect single photon sources. If you're developing single photon sources, you know that you always have a tiny probability of having an extra photon in your pulse. You have the one photon you want and sometimes a little bit of noise that you don't want. And this affects the Hongo-Mandel interference. When you measure the indistinguishability of a single photon source normally, what you do is that you take your photons, you make them as indistinguishable as possible, you send them at the input of a beam feature, and you have two detectors at the output, and you measure the number of coincidences in this configuration. This is T parallel here. In principle, if the photons are fully indistinguishable, it should be zero. Then you do a, a, a check measurement by making one of the photons completely different from the other. For instance, you make it cross-polarized for the first one. And now you have uh, possibilities to have double clicks on the detectors, and you have another coincident count that I call a C perpendicular. The Hongo model visibility is, divided, is defined like this C parallel minus C, per, C perpendicular minus C parallel over C perpendicular. This uh, visibility allows to extract the mean wave packet overlap if you don't have perfectly reflect 50 50 beam splitter. This is the relation that allows you to have the mean wave packet of overlap or the indistinguishability of your photon. But now what happens when you uh, have an extra tiny bit of more than one photon in your state? What happens is that these extra photons, of course, will lead to coincidences here, even if the photons are completely indistinguishable. In other, in other words, I'm interested in this single photon wave packet overlap here, which uh, is defined like this uh, in the very symbolic way, in graphic way, but also from the G2 of the source. 
And so now the Hongo Mandel visibility is not very simply related to this single photon overlap that I'm looking for. So in practice, it's very important if you are developing single photon sources to be able to distinguish between the different uh, parameters that affect the visibility. Because in our case, for instance, the indistinguishability depends on the spin noise, the charge noise, the phonon coupling, the time jitter, whereas the G2 sometimes is affected by laser leakage re-excitation. And uh, optimizing your source means um, controlling all these parameters and they can all affect your visibility in a different way. So in the past, there were some first uh, theory to uh, consider how you go from the single photon, the mean wave packet overlap from the visibility, taking into account the G2 of the source. This paper uh, actually shows that what the, this relation, very simple relation telling you that the visibility is M minus G2 actually gives you access to the mean wave packet overlap of the total noisy state. This uh, we main wave packet overlap here. It's not the one I, I, I want to access because as I said, this extra uh, photon here is just the noise for me. And I want to be able to know what is the intrinsic property of my state as compared to the noisy part of my state. So for that, we have developed a new uh, theoretical formalism where now we introduce different kinds of wave packet overlap. So there is the total wave packet overlap, the single photon uh, overlap. This is the quantity I'm interested in to optimize my tool and understand how it works. And there is a signal and noise wave packet overlap. These two can be completely different. Your noise can be completely different from the main photon. So our collaborators, uh, Stephen Vide and uh, Christoph Simon from the University of Calgary, derived in a, in a case where the noise is separable, where the additional photon is not entangled with the main one, they uh, derived a formula which tells you that your single photon uh, wave packet overlap, MS, is related to the visibility of the Hongo Mandel um, interference with this relation where you have also this noise to signal mean wave packet overlap that enter into play. So it's very interesting because depending on the nature of your noise, you see that the correction is very is going to be different. If your noise, uh, the extra photon you have, is exactly the same as the uh, first photon, your, your main photon state. Here, it means that MSN is equal to MS. Then the, the equation is uh, very simple. It's V equal M minus G2. But if the noise is completely distinguishable, there is no overlap between your main photon and your noise photon, then now the distinguishable case tells you that V here is related to MS in a different way here. We the slope here, which can be N plus M, 1 plus M. So we test experimentally these two limiting case to see if this model is uh, valid and can actually describe what we observe, and then to understand the physics of our source more. So we test the limiting case by making a source of single photon where we add on purpose a distinguishable noise. So we take our, one of our best single photon source, and then we add a little bit of laser on the side, very, very little, which is completely spectrally different from the main source. So this is a, a case where the M, the overlap is completely is, is zero between the main photon and the quantum dot photon and the noise photon, sorry. And what we do then is that we can control the level of extra photon we add. So it increases the G2 and we can measure the Hongo Mandel uh, visibility uh, by increasing the G2 on purpose. And we observe this point here, this green point, which actually fits perfectly with our theoretical prediction here where we have just one parameter, MS, which defines first the value at origin and the slope of our data and shows that we indeed have this kind of relation between the visibility and the single photon wave packet when the noise is distinguishable. Then we can go to the case where we have ident identical noise. So for that, we take our single photon source. We take one of the, we take two pulses. The main photon here will be uh, our main photon, but then we take a little bit of the second one. We add um, a delay and we merge it on the beam speaker at the output so we can create uh, an extra, we can introduce an extra photon here once in a while. And we can repeat the same measurement controlling the, the level of noise, so increasing the G2 progressively. And now these are these dark blue points. And you see now that when the noise is identical to the main photon, actually now the visibility is given by M minus G2. So we have now tested and shown that uh, when you have a noise, uh, an extra photon in your single photon source, it will affect tremendously differently your single photon source. 
And to understand what is the limitation of your source, it's very interesting to understand the, the origin of your noise. So I will illustrate that with some um, experiment that we did. So in our quantum dot, as you understood, we have two ways of making a single photon source. We can use either a charged quantum dot or a neutral quantum dot, what we call a next in our triangle. This is a measurement that we did with the resonant excitation scheme where we excite with, with one polarization and uh, collect a single photon in the cross polarization scheme. It was, we were not yet using the quantum assisted excitation. What you observe here is that when we increase the pulse duration, so we excite with a laser pulse, we can, which we can make longer and longer, we have a very uh, different behavior for the two sources. For the neutral charge quantum dot, neutral quantum dot, we obtain that the G2 is always better when we increase the pulse duration. Whereas when, for, when we use a, a neutral, sorry, a charge quantum dot, a trion, we have actually an increase of the G2 when we increase the pulse duration. Now which we can uh, understand from the physics of it, and I will not go into the detail, is that in one case, actually the G2 is limited by the imperfect laser suppression. Whereas in the other case, it's limited by re-excitation of the state. We excite and uh, emit a photon and have another photon that's emitted exactly at the, uh, afterward. But what is very striking is that if now we plot the Hongo-Mandel visibility as a function of the G2, so here, for instance, increasing the pulse duration, we observe, we fit the data without knowing uh, what is the signal to noise overlap here. And we find actually that our observation are uh, very well reproduced with uh, almost a zero signal and noise uh, overlap here, which means that in our quantum dot sources, most, uh, most of the extra photon regate are completely distinguishable from the main photon, which actually is a good news because you can probably get rid of them, especially for instance, using a tiny uh, more uh, stringent spectral filter. Okay, now in the last part of my talk, if I still have a little time, I think it's okay. Um, I will uh, present uh, an application of our single photon sources uh, that we have developed with uh, Agai Eisenberg from the University of Jerusalem, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and published recently in the Astrophone here, where we use one of our single photon sources to generate most sophisticated states of light, which are linear cluster states of light. So the idea is that if we want to have a uh, scalability in the future for quantum computing and even for quantum communication, there are some resources which are highly sought, which is the generation of highly uh, entangled uh, well, light states where many photons are entangled. So this is what has been proposed, for instance, to um, implement measurement-based quantum computation or also measurement-based quantum repeaters. And the states we want to generate are states where you have, for instance, uh, the circles here are photons and each line is an uh, entanglement. So we will not generate this kind of state yet. We will generate linear cluster state. But uh, I want to show you that the previous approach to generate such states uh, adopted by the parametric conversion community, the nonlinear optics community, has been based on very complex structures. So they take uh, several crystals and uh, they, each uh, crystal generates photon pairs and you multiplex here uh, the number of crystals and you, you need a very high power of laser to generate a highly uh, light state where you have several untangled photons and the state of the art is twice and it's still the state of the art. What I want to present is a different approach that has been proposed by the group of Agai Eisenberg, which actually is perfectly suited for our sources. Our source generates photons in a, in a pulsed way, in a clocked way, where a, a single photon is generating every 12 nanoseconds. So the idea of Agai, published in this paper here, is to couple these trains of photon in a system where you have a gate here which entangles the photon and a delay loop. Can you hear me? Yes, Can yes. Can you hear me? Yes, because my, my mic was shut down at some point. Okay. So the idea is that the photon enters the loop and uh, have a probability one half to enter the loop or not. And uh, if they enter the loop, they have a probability to meet the uh, next photon and be untangled with the next one. So this is what we call a sequential entangler. So in practice, we implemented this like this. We have our cryostat with our single photon source. We have our uh, fiber here, sending the photon into this uh, rack size uh, scheme, which is just very basic box where you have 
prioritizing being feature polarization controllers, a delay loop here and uh, at the output here, also uh, polarizing these features and two detectors to not only create the state but analyze the state. All these fit into this box. So it has a very uh, little number of resources needed to generate the cluster state. If we look from a logical point of view, what happens is that the photons uh, undergo first some Adam Argate, so some polarization rotation, then is entangled with uh, the next photon in the, at the beam feature here. Then you have the loop, uh, which is kind of in a very simple quantum memory, and then another gate for the next photon, etc. And then here at the output, you have the analysis of this loop. And you see here, each component is very simple in, in terms of implementation. So we uh, implemented this schema with various of our sources, which have uh, uh, different qualities, uh, higher indistinguishability or higher brightness. And we did that for two, three, and four photons, where we generate states which are uh, indicated here below. Uh, this is, um, these are linear cluster states at four photons. And uh, the group of our guys, uh, we, so in these measurements, we cannot do a full topography of the state but they were able to derive an, an entanglement witness. And they could show that actually we have a uh, generative state where we have a, 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 a lower bound for an entanglement here, W tilde, which uh, if it's negative, the state is entangled. And you see that up to four photons with two standard deviation, we have demonstrated the generation of four photon entanglement. Our objective, of course, is to go beyond this number, uh, knowing that in this experimentation, we had very inefficient detectors and uh, the setup was not proficient and this was, uh, has been strongly improved since then. So this is our objective to go to higher numbers. Okay, so this brings me to my conclusion. So I've presented you three recent results, uh, how we make our source brighter, how we try to understand better their limitation, the noise, and uh, how we start to use them to implement um, quantum computing skills or quantum computing resources. I want to mention also some paper where we have um, benchmarked our technology. So we fabricate many of our devices and we checked uh, how reproducible are the source performance. And we see that we have many devices with very high indistinguishability. And we are now working in the, in, into the, um, the idea of trying to make a remote source identical. Uh, it's a work we couldn't do before because we moved into a new lab and we had the clean room closed for three years. And with this, I want to thank the beautiful uh, team uh, that I'm very lucky to work with. Um, on the growth side, uh, the Aristide Lemaitre made some wonderful uh, quantum dots. We have help from the technology cell from Isabel Klein, uh, theoretical support from Alexia Ofev and Christoph uh, Simon and Stephen Wein from uh, Calgary. And here you can see uh, all the amazing young and talented uh, students and postdocs that I have the chance to work with. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Pascal, for this wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for one question. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, I, have, I, I will start with one question myself. In the first part of your talk, uh, in this phonon assistant creation of photons, uh, is the, does it matter that the photon is probably entangled with the phonon when it, when it leaves or that is irrelevant? Um, I don't think the photons, the, what do you mean? The photons are entangled? Yeah, with the photon that leaves. Um, yeah, well, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, I don't think this, uh, this is the case. I think the, the photon process is still incoherent. Uh, so I don't think this is the case, uh, but I should check. But I think you know, on the theory side, they have not uh, included this possibility. Okay. Okay, there is one question uh, by Stefan Clement that says, is, is there undistinguishable or undistinguishability across sources? Yeah, so this is what I, we, I started to, to mention. Uh, sorry, here. Yeah. We are doing this measurement where we are trying to, uh, to do two source interference right now. And so what we have observed so far is almost 70% indistinguishability for two different sources. But I must stress that uh, this was done is in very non-optimal conditions. We have a lot of noise in our lab that we are fighting and it's not related to the source itself. It's uh, in extrinsic noise that probably limits a lot what we have here. So this is clearly our goal, we can do better. 
Okay, I think we have to move on. Thank you very much, Pascal. Thank you. And the next talk is, is going to be by Joe Randall. And his talk is from multi-qubit register for quantum networks based on the spins in, in Diamond. Okay, you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so hi everyone. Um, so it's great to be here today. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my, uh, the group's work. Um, so my name is Joe Randall. I'm a postdoc in the group of Tim Tominiao in uh, QTech in TU Delft. And uh, I'm going to tell you today about some work we've been doing to realize multi-qubit registers for uh, quantum networks based on uh, spins and diamonds. Um, so quantum networks are made up of uh, a number of uh, nodes that uh, can each contain multiple qubits. And these are connected together by photonic links. And these can be used to distribute entanglement over the network. So the motivation for such a network is firstly for quantum cryptography, where you can send uh, secure, secure messages over long distances, but also for distributed quantum computation, where you perform your computation over a, ne a network in a kind of naturally scalable way and also for fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. So in our group, we use the Nitrogen Vacancy Center in Diamond as our, uh, the platform for this, such a quantum network. Um, and uh, the Nitrogen Vacancy Center is a defect in the diamond lattice where a nitrogen atom replaces a carbon atom in the uh, lattice. And next to that is a vacant site that hosts an electron spin. Now here you can see a simplified energy level structure of this uh, electron spin. And it has a spin one ground state where we can use two of the levels to form a qubit. And typically we use the uh, ms equals zero and ms equals minus one levels as our qubit states. Um, now by shining in a laser at 637 nanometers, we can uh, spin selectively read out and initialize this spin with high fidelity. We can also apply microwaves at around one gigahertz to control the spin state. And here you can see a Rabi oscillation showing high fidelity control of this spin. So just to give you an idea of uh, the experiment, uh, we perform all our experiments at uh, uh, 4 Kelvin in a closed cycle cryostat. And if we look inside here, you see a chip that contains a diamond sample. And inside this diamond sample, there are NV centers. And if we zoom in even further, you see this solid immersion lens that we fabricate into the surface of the diamond. And this allows us to efficiently extract, extract the uh, light that allows us to uh, read out with high fidelity. You can also see a, a gold strip line fabricated on top of the uh, diamond surface that we use for applying the microwave signals that allow us to control the qubit state. So uh, one of the components of uh, such a quantum network is uh, the photonic links. And the scheme that's used uh, in Delft, mainly in the group of Ronald Hansen, is uh, the following. So firstly, you, have, you take two uh, of these NV centers in separate uh, uh, cryostats, and then you entangle the spin state with a optical photon then you send these optical photons to a 50-50 beam splitter that's in a mid station. Then these, uh, uh, this interferes the photons and then you can detect uh, the outcome, the output ports on the single uh, photon uh, detectors. And from this, you can herald entanglement between the spins, uh, between the two spins. So this uh, scheme has uh, uh, been used for a number of exciting demonstrations in the last few years. And here you can see a picture of the TU Delft campus uh, this is the physics building that contains uh, most of our experiments. And in this work, they uh, took an NV center located it over here, and they entangled it with another NV center over one kilometer away, you can see in the distance over here. And then they then used this to uh, realize a loophole free uh, bell test. Um, you can also, uh, they also used this uh, to create, to perform entanglement distillation which is where you create two copies of an entangled state and then use, combine them together to create a single high fidelity state. And finally, a uh, very recent result from the group of Ronald Hansen is that they made uh, demonstrated a three node network where they showed they can create a GHZ state of all three, uh, over all three uh, nodes. And also they showed entanglement swapping between the two end nodes. So this uh, scheme uh, seems very promising. But in this talk, I'm going to focus on the other aspect of uh, such quantum networks, which is creating these multi-qubit nodes. So why do we want multi-qubit nodes? Well, most advanced uh, network protocols need multiple qubits in order to store and process uh, the uh, information. So for example, for entanglement distillation or quantum repeaters, you need multiple qubits. Um, you can also, for distributed quantum computation and error correction, 
you need many qubits in order to encode logical qubits. And also something that I'm going to touch on at the end of the talk is that you could also use such a multi-qubit device for quantum simulations. And that's something that we've been working on a bit more recently. So the approach that we take in our group is to use uh, carbon-13 nuclear spins as, uh, these, to create these multi-qubit registers. So these couple to the NV center via the dipole-dipole interaction, and they make up around 1% of the uh, diamond lattice. Um, so typically we talk to spins that are uh, within around two nanometers from the NV center. And this corresponds to couplings of somewhere in the right, region of one to 100 kilohertz. So to see how we can control these spins, we can think what happens to the nuclear spin for different electron spin states. So firstly, if the electron is in the state ms equals zero, then there's effectively no interaction between uh, the electron and nuclear spins. And it's as if uh, there's uh, basically, as if the electron wasn't there. So you just get this, the nuclear spin just processes at the Lamour frequency, which is set by the externally applied magnetic field. Now, if we flip the electron to the ms equals minus one state, then the hyperfine interaction is turned on, and this leads to two different effects. Firstly, the spin uh, frequencies are all shifted, and that's due to this parallel component of the hyperfine interaction. And importantly, this is different for every nuclear spin because they're all at different positions, and therefore they all have different frequencies. And this is what allows us in the end to selectively address different nuclear spins. Um, additionally, the uh, precession axis of the nuclear spin is tilted, and that's due to this perpendicular component of the hyperfine interaction. And this means that there's, uh, for the two different electron states, there's a different rotation axis, and therefore we have a conditional rotation of the nuclear spins. So this is uh, how an, uh, the electron interacts with a single nuclear spin, but in reality, there's many nuclear spins uh, around the NV center, and it feels this interaction from all of them at once. And actually this leads to a fairly short dephasing time of the electron spin of around five microseconds for the T2 star. So to increase this coherence time, we can use dynamical decoupling. This is where we apply a sequence of microwave pulses, as shown in this sequence on the right here, uh, where their spacing is characterized by this parameter tau. Now, if we do this, we can decouple from all of the nuclear spins in the environment. And actually, we can extend the coherence time by six orders of magnitude using this scheme uh, to increase the coherence time to over one second. So this is uh, really nice for the electron spin. But the problem is it decouples from all of the spins, and so we're left with just having a single qubit again. But actually, by uh, tuning uh, tau, that's the spacing between the pulses, we can actually tune this uh, sequence to become resonant with individual nuclear spins in the environment. So here you can see some experimental data where we prepare the electron in a superposition and we sweep tau. And you can see that there are multiple dips in the coherence. And actually, each of these dips corresponds to individual nuclear spins in the environment. Now, if we set the uh, parameters n and tau of this sequence correctly, and this actually turns out to be a controlled rotation of the nuclear spin, where the uh, rotation, the direction of rotation depends on the electron spin state. Now, if we set this rotation angle theta to be pi over two, this is equivalent to a C naught gate. And therefore, this is a universal two qubit gate that we can use to initialize and read out individual nuclear spins. So this works really well uh, and has been used for the last few years in our group and other groups. Um, but one drawback is that it uh, only works for particular spins that have a fairly strong perpendicular component of this hyperfine interaction. And as I said before, this depends on the exact position of this nuclear spin uh, relative to the NV center. So for some spins, they just have a weak perpendicular uh, hyperfine coupling and therefore, they're hard to control with this method. So an alternative approach is to directly drive the nuclear spins using RF pulses. So here you can see a sweep of the RF frequency where we're initializing and reading out an individual nuclear spin for um, using the dynamical decoupling sequences. And here you can see the, re the uh, resonance for the two different electron spin states, ms equals zero and ms equals minus one. Now for ms equals zero, the uh, the spins all have the same frequency, and therefore this is a global rotation of all nuclear spins at once. But for ms equals minus one, uh, since the spins have different frequencies, this is actually a selective uh, rotation of the nuclear spins. And actually we can perform arbitrary rotations by tuning the amplitude or the pulse length and also the phase of the RF field. 
so that we can uh, perform arbitrary rotations. And uh, the nice thing is this doesn't depend on this perpendicular hyperfine component. So we can do use this to rotate spins that we couldn't access using the dynamical decoupling method. So, so far this is just single qubit rotations, but actually we can combine this with dynamical decoupling in order to make a two qubit gate based on RF driving. So the idea here is to apply a similar sequence as I showed before, but now where we uh, apply dynamical decoupling to the electron spin, but now in between these pulses, we apply RF pulses where we directly drive a, sele a selected uh, nuclear spin. Um, and here you see a uh, state tomography after we prepared a bell state with high fidelity using this new gate. And actually this is performed on a spin that we couldn't control before because it has a very weak perpendicular hyperfine coupling. So putting all of these uh, methods together, we demonstrated a 10 qubit register in the system. But the 10 qubits are formed of the electron and nitrogen spins associated with the NV center, plus eight of these carbon-13 nuclear spins that are close by. So firstly, we prepared a bell state between every pair of spins in the register. So here you can see the bell state fidelity for each pair. And you can see that it's uh, in all cases above the classical bound of 0 0.5, indicating that we have a universally connected register. Secondly, we uh, made uh, large entangled states. And here you can see the GHZ state fidelity as a function of the number of qubits involved. And you can see that up to seven qubits, it's above the classical bound of 0 0.5, indicating entanglement. And finally, we uh, showed this uh, system can be a good quantum memory by storing arbitrary single qubit states for over one minute using dynamical decoupling sequences. And this system actually holds a number of records for solid state spins, including the most qubits, the largest entangled state, and the longest coherence time for a single spin qubit. So 10 qubits is already uh, nice, but can we push this even further and control even more spins? So, so far we've been looking at the more strongly coupled spins. And if we look at the dynamical decoupling spectrum, these lead to well isolated dips. And this allows us to selectively control these spins. However, for more further away spins that are more weakly coupled to the NV center, then this leads to more spectral overlap in the dynamical decoupling signal. And this means we get crosstalk when we try and perform gates, and that leads to lower fidelities. So one challenge is how do we selectively address these weaker coupled spins? So our approach is to use the nuclear-nuclear couplings. So these uh, nuclear spins also coupled together via the dipole-dipole interaction. And we can access these weaker coupled spins through these stronger coupled ones, which we can read out and initialize uh, using the NV sent. So how do we measure these nuclear-nuclear couplings? Well, a simple approach would be to just perform a Ramsey experiment on a nuclear spin. So here you uh, just polarize uh, and read out a nuclear spin using these dynamical decoupling sequences. And then you, in the middle of this, you uh, allow the spin to evolve for some time t. Now, if you do this, this is a typical signal. You see this kind of complex beating and decay shape. This is due to the fact that this spin is interacting with all of the other spins in its environment at the same time. If we take the Fourier transform, you see this complex spectrum that's hard to resolve. And so this is uh, not uh, the nicest way to measure the uh, couplings between the nuclear spins. We can also extend the coherence time of the nuclear spins using dynamical decoupling. And here you see an example where we extended the coherence from around 10 milliseconds for the T2 star to over 10 seconds using 400 dynamical decoupling pulses. So this is nice, but then again, we've decoupled this uh, targeted spin from all of the other spins. So we have no signal left and we're not measuring anything about the nuclear, nuclear couplings. To get around this, we can use this sequence called spin echo double resonance or SEDL. And here we take uh, one spin that we can initialize and uh, read out with the NV center. This will be our probe spin and we apply dy dynamical decoupling, but then we also apply the same pulse to a, another target spin. This is the one we want to measure the coupling to. And what this does is it recouples the spin-spin uh, interaction between the two spins that we are uh, targeting with these RF pulses. So do you, it, you only measure this single coupling. And here you can see an example of this, where you see that there's a, a single frequency that we can measure very accurately using this sequence. So now we can use this uh, sequence to sense the environment of an of a individual nuclear spin. So we can uh, take a 
a certain uh, probe spin that we can initialize and read out with the NV center. And then we can sweep the uh, frequency of this target spin pulse. And then we'll, uh, if we do this, we'll see a peak whenever the, uh, we uh, come into resonance with a spin that, uh, also, that interacts with the probe spin. So for example, this spin could correspond to a spin here, this uh, peak, sorry. This peak could correspond to this uh, spin and this peak could correspond to this spin. Now, if we also sweep the uh, interaction time, then we can extract the, uh, what it, the strength of the coupling between the two spins. So this 2D scan gives us what spins couple to our probe spin and how strongly they couple. And we can also do this uh, for different probe spins. And that gives us a 3D scan of which uh, spins couple to every other spin and, with, and how strongly they couple to each other. So we did this for 27 spins in the environment of a uh, single NV center. And uh, in this plot, you can see the uh, entire data set summarized. And this is 171 uh, couplings. And uh, on the X and Y axis, you see the spin frequencies uh, when the electron is in the MS equals minus one state. So these dashed lines correspond to individual spins and where they intersect, that corresponds to a coupling that we measured. So, uh, and also the, the size and the color of this dot tells you how strong this coupling is. So uh, there's a lot of information in here. And actually, uh, this is uh, the dipole couplings and that depends on the relative position of the spins. And therefore this actually encodes the spatial structure of these nuclear spins. So we can use this data set to extract the 3D structure of the, uh, of the cluster of spins. This is actually a not so trivial problem. It required a purpose-built algorithm to, uh, to turn this uh, couplings into the coordinates. But we managed to do this, and this is what the uh, structure turned out to look like. So uh, the orange balls are the carbon-13 uh, nuclear spins that we measured. And you can see the NV center in the middle here. And the blue lines, they correspond to the strongest couplings between the nuclear spins, and they show you something about the connectivity of this cluster. And actually, we liked this uh, cluster so much that we decided to build a real-life model. So here you can see some pictures from uh, before corona times, and we could all sit on the same table. And it took uh, five of us a full day, pretty much, to uh, build this model. And here you can see the result. The white balls correspond to uh, carbon-12 atoms, making up the diamond lattice. And these yellow balls are the carbon-13 spins that we imaged in this work. And if you see just in the center here, you can see the NV center. So this is uh, nice for understanding the spin environment and could lead to higher fidelity quantum information because we really uh, know a lot about the environment of our qubits. Um, if this could also lead to more potential qubits because we have, we've identified more spins that could be used as qubits. But another aspect of this uh, work is that it's a step towards a visionary goal of quantum sensing, which is to image spin structures outside of the diamond. So the idea would be to put an NV center very close to the surface of the diamond and then uh, put some uh, structure that you want to image, like a molecule or a protein or a 2D material, for example, and then use the NV center to uh, image it. And this, uh, this work is a kind of a step towards this, but using a spin structure inside of the diamond. Okay, so finally, I'm gonna briefly tell you about some uh, more recent work, which is where we, uh, so we have this 27 uh, spin system where the, all the spins are interacting. We wanted uh, to investigate whether we can use this for quantum simulations of many body physics. So we've been working on a quantum simulation of a so-called discrete time crystal, which is a recently discovered phase of matter that spontaneously breaks discrete time translational symmetry. So we took a subset of nine of these carbon-13 nuclear spins, and we applied this sequence that you can see on the right here. Um, so this is a Floquet sequence where uh, it consists of some interaction time uh, between the spins and also some rotations where we use these RF pulses to rotate the nuclear spins. And then we can uh, repeat the sequence n times. So this, uh, uh, this sequence has a number of parameters we can vary, namely the rotation angles, the interaction time per block of the sequence, and also the number of cycles. So what do we expect? Well, here you can see a sketch of the expected phase diagram for such a sequence. Um, so where the two uh, axes show the interaction time and the rotation angle. Now, if we apply the pulses, the rotations uh, close to pi, but not exactly equal to pi, 
then this is kind of like applying pi pulses with some on purpose pulse errors. Now, if we have very short interaction times, then what we expect to see in our signal, this is a theoretical uh, like simulation. We expect to see that the uh, spin starts uh, to flip, like if you were to apply pi pulses, but then they, uh, the signal decays due to the fact that we're applying these pulse errors on purpose by not setting this rotation angle equal to pi. However, if we increase the uh, interaction time, then actually the interactions between the spins stabilize this subharmonic response. And this is a many body effect that's a, a key signature of this discrete time crystal phase. So now I can show you some first results from the experiment, where you, here you see the individual spin magnetizations as a function of the number of cycles of this Floquet sequence. So firstly, for the lower interaction time, the shorter interaction time, where we don't expect to see this discrete time crystal phase, you see that the uh, magnetizations uh, start, start oscillating, but then uh, decay as we increase it in. However, if we increase the interaction time, we enter this DTC phase, and then you see that this uh, subharmonic oscillation is stabilized due to the interactions between the spins. And you can see this more clearly if, you, uh, if we average over the magnetization for all of the spins. We see that in the orange case corresponding to the short time, the signal decays. And for the blue case corresponding to the longer interaction time, we see that this subharmonic response persists to longer times. So this is a, a demonstration of a discrete time crystal in this system. So to summarize, uh, the NV center uh, with the surrounding carbon-30 nuclear spins is a versatile multi-qubit device. And importantly, it's compatible with uh, quantum networks. So these photonic entanglement schemes I introduced at the beginning of the talk uh, would work with this, uh, these quantum registers. We showed control over 10, uh, 10 qubits in the system and also identified 27 more carbon-13 spins, which gives us 19 potential additional qubits for future experiments. And finally, I showed some uh, first results of a quantum simulation of a discrete time crystal. So with that, I'd like to thank the uh, rest of the group, especially Connor Bradley and Mohamed Ababay, who uh, also uh, worked on this uh, with me. And uh, with that, I'll thank you for listening and look forward to any questions. Okay, Joe, sir. Thank you very much for this uh, great talk. I will start with, with one question. It's uh, related to the number of uh, uh, nuclear spins that, that you found. Do you think this is typical of, of uh, the surrounding of a typical MB center or there should be variations? How, how many of, of them can you address, I think? Yeah, so um, we expect that this sample is fairly uh, typical. It's a natural iso uh, isotopic uh, Pure, you know, it's a natural um, amount of carbon-13. Um, the only um, thing that we selected on was that there wasn't a very strongly coupled nuclear spin. Um, that's the only kind of pre-selection we did on this sample. And in fact, in other samples, we see similar, similar things. And we haven't uh, pushed it as far in other samples, but you definitely see, you know, similar spectra when you do this dynamical decoupling sequences. So it should be fairly uh, similar to any other sample. Okay, there is a question in the chat that is a kind of a follow-up of uh, my question that is by Alejandro González Tudela that asks what are the main problems to scale to systems with larger system with larger systems of qubits? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if in this system we're uh, just using a single NV center to sense the uh, nuclear spin surrounding it, so um, in that case, um, you know, there's a limit to how far you can uh, scale that because eventually it's going to, the couplings are going to get very weak and then you're not going to be able to selectively control uh, the spin. Um, so we, we think uh, we could probably get to something like 100 uh, qubits in, in this system if we really push it. But then to scale for beyond that, um, there's kind of two approaches that, uh, that I think make the most sense. One is um, obviously to integrate these into quantum networks. So distribute uh, entanglement between different nodes and have, you have multiple nodes, each containing you know, tens of qubits. Another approach that's uh, uh, quite, uh, yes, yeah, become quite nice recently is that you can implant uh, defects into the diamond with very high spatial resolution. And if you can do this, you could potentially create arrays of uh, defects that are coupled. These would be like electron spins that are uh, coupled together. And there you could maybe create much larger arrays. 
So those, I think, are the two uh, approaches to, to scale this further. Okay, we have one additional question is by Luis Rax that says that, thank you very much for the talk. In the setting of the quantum network, what is the advantage of using nuclear spins in nodes as opposed to additional MB centers? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, one one problem with additional NV centers is it's um, it's hard to get NV centers that are close enough together that they actually couple. So this hasn't this is has been done, but it's usually by kind of uh, implanting many NV uh, many defects in the same uh, sample or kind of getting lucky, and therefore you get like two that are close together. But it's hard to at the moment to get a system where you have multiple defects. But I think uh, in with uh, advancing technology. It, it, this definitely could be a, an alternative approach to have additional defects uh, to make a multi-qubit register with yeah with multiple defects. But uh, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Joe. And now we have a mini break, and we reconvene at uh, uh, six twenty-five in eight minutes. Okay. Next speaker is Daniel Riedel, and he's going to talk about personal enhancement of team vacancy centers in Diamond. So, Daniel, please. Hi, uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our recent results from uh, Vukovic Lab at Stanford on, uh, on the personal enhancement of team vacancy centers in Diamond. Um, this work was done in a close collaboration with Alison Rugar and uh, Sharia. Uh, Agai Mebodi, and as you can see here, we recently put our results um, on archive. Um, the motivation of our work is to create um, a solid state spin photon interface for the use in quantum networks. Uh, quantum network ideally consists of long list uh, quantum memories, memories which you can uh, interlink um, with, um, with emitted photons to uh, create um, remote entanglement. Um, as the previous speaker has um, nicely explained already, uh, color centers in diamond are ideally suited for creating such a quantum network. Since uh, using these color centers, you can, um, um, these color centers have an extremely long spin coherence time on the order of seconds. And in addition, you can use um, adjacent nuclear spins um, as a resource um, and as controllable qubits in a quantum register. Um, as the name suggests, the uh, nitrogen vacancy is made up by replacing two carbon atoms here in the diamond lattice by a nitrogen atom and an adjacent vacancy. Um, the electrons of the dangling bonds of the, of the carbon orbitals and the nitrogen um, plus an additionally captured electron uh, make up a spin triplet system uh, in a ground and excited state, um, which are um, interlinked with, um, with um, sharp optical transitions. Um, as you can see here, and they are spin selective. So when you resonantly excite a single NV center, you can resolve um, six individual transitions from ground to excited state. Um, and these transitions, uh, using these transitions, you can um, link the spin state um, to an optical photon. So now in order to use these uh, NV centers in a quantum network, you also need to be able to efficiently couple um, these uh, spin entangled photons to um, a single optical mode. And typically people use um, fibers for that. Um, since for color centers, um, the single photon creation efficiency is typically very low. Um, in order to create uh, entanglement, people use um, a heralded scheme where you send photons from two remote quantum nodes um, onto a beam splitter, you interfere them and you detect them. And this detection event um, then um, projects the two remote spins into an entangled state. So using this scheme, um, the lab of Ronald Hanson in, in Delft um, has recently demonstrated the implementation of a three-node quantum network. 
Um, the nice thing about coupling photons into fibers is that you have access to all these nice tools of a fiber network. So you can, in principle, use a fiber switch to um, select which quantum node you want to entangle. Um, so this all looks great. So, so why don't we have um, NV-based quantum network yet? And why, why are we still at three nodes? So one of the main reasons is that the NV center, um, mo uh, mostly most of the NV uh, photons can actually not be used for this scheme. So uh, as you can see in, in this sketch here, um, the NV uh, strongly couples to lattice vibrations. So actually most of the time when you excite the NV center, um, it recombines and um, with and is accompanied by an additional phonon emission, which uh, gives rise to this phonon sideband. And actually, only in about three percent of the cases, um, a photon is emitted into the direct electronic transition. Um, photons emitted into the sideband uh, cannot be used for entanglement schemes um, because, um, like, the phonon has which path information. So you you cannot use um, these kind of photons. Um, so, so the photons are not indistinguishable anymore because some of the information is, is in the in the phonon. Um, as a lot of previous uh, speakers have um, also shown already, you can drastically improve, improve the efficiency of an emitter by using cavity coupling, as indicated um, in the sketch here. So you can strongly enhance this zero phonon line emission, which is basically the direct electronic transition without additional phonon emission. And in addition, also the photon emission is channeled into a single mode, which um, can give rise to very high photon collection efficiencies. Um, these, uh, dim uh, these optical resonators have been implemented in diamond um, using 2D and, and 1D photonic crystal cavities. And um, um, based on, on the extremely small mode volumes um, and the fact that the enhancement factor scales with the ratio of the quality factor of the mode volume, um, people have shown that they could enhance um, the zero phone line emission rate by um, a factor up to 70 which then leads to more than 70% of the photons being emitted into the cavity mode. So this is great. However, um, the diamond nanofabrication um, introduces um, charge fluctuations in the vicinity of the NV center. And the actual figure of merit that you need for using NVs in the quantum network is, is not just the percent enhancement, it's actually the cooperativity, um, which is essentially um, dividing the, the good rates here, the emission, the percent hunt emission into the zero phone line by the bad rates, which is um, again here the sideband emission, uh, non radiative decay is negligible for the NV center, but the main problem here is this, um, uh, is this defacing rate, which, as I said before, is induced by um, charge, uh, by fluctuating charges in the vicinity. And in case of these resonators, this um, is actually the dominant rate, so it's up to three orders of magnitude larger. Um, than, than the natural um, line width. So um, what can you do about it? A potential solution is using the platform that was also mentioned by a previous speaker. So you can in, uh, incorporate a diamond membrane, which can potentially be way thicker. So you're um, further away from like uh, fluctuating uh, surface charges um, to, to uh, enhance the zero phonon line emission. So um, during my PhD work, we have shown that with this approach, you can also um, uh, reach uh, decent enhancement factors. However, um, there's still significant broadening of the optical line. So it's an order of magnitude improvement, um, but there's still um, more um, work to be done. And uh, the, the trick to be played is essentially just increasing the diamond thickness, which again, uh, your, your enhancement factor takes a hit. But in, in also, again, in the group of Ronald Hanson, they've shown that you can uh, obtain line widths which are very close or approaching the, the lifetime limit. Um, another um, approach is to simply use a different color center. And here, uh, negatively charged group four vacancy stand centers stand out. So one of the main advantages is actually here that they have the split vacancy configuration. So you have a, a group four element, which is accompanied by like um, half a vacancy on both sides, uh, which um, uh, leads to an inversion symmetric um, geometry and, and uh, a vanishing uh, permanent electric dipole moment. So the defect um, does couple way less to fluctuating surface charges. Uh, in addition, it also couples less to lattice vibrations, which then um, results in a larger fraction of zero phonon line emission and also in a small inhomogeneous broadening of the emitters. So if you have an ensemble of, of emitters in, in a device, um, their transition frequencies 
um, are spread by, by just a very small number. Actually, in, in uh, low strain bulk crystal, people have even shown that it's uh, on the order of the of the uh, lifetime limit. So you you can get uh, you can easily find um, overlapping emitters just in a bulk crystal. Um, so out of, um, out of these group four color centers, the SIV center has been uh, most used and uh, very impressive results have been shown. So um, people managed to, to couple these silicon vacancy centers to um, photonic crystal cavities without significantly broadening uh, the optical transition and cooperativities of more than 100 have been shown. Um, also, they, um, in, the group of, uh, in the group of Misha Lukin and Harvard, they have shown that you can use the nuclear spin uh, as a resource, similarly to uh, the ENVY center. Um, other um, important results is here um, that um, they have shown that you can incorporate two SIV centers um, and couple them to the same cavity mode and, and uh, mediate a two, uh, two qubit um, interaction. So this is all, all great, but the SIV center actually has some drawbacks. So it suffers from a low quantum efficiency. So there's a large fraction of non radiated um, tra uh, transition. Um, this is not the main problem because if you have a high cooperativity, you can actually overcome the shortcoming. Uh, the bigger problem is um, the, the poor spin coherence at, ele at elevated temperatures. So all these results um, needed um, cooling in a, in a dilution refrigerator. And the reason for that is here that the ground state uh, comprises two um, uh, electronic doublets. It's, it's an electronic doublet, so it, it uh, comprises two uh, um, orbital states, and they are split by only 50 gigahertz. So phonon-induced um, defacing is one of the main sources for spin decoherence. Um, because of this shortcoming, um, people have um, decided to look um, into group four color centers um, with, with heavier elements. So here, tin vacancy centers um, are uh, specifically promising because uh, long spin coherence times at, at uh, elevated temperatures have been shown, and this is mainly due to the increased uh, ground state splitting. And in addition, also a higher quantum efficiency um, is useful to, to achieving even higher cooperativities. Uh, one of the issues with these heavier elements is actually to create the vacancy centers because tin is actually quite large compared to the carbon lattice. So you need to, uh, if you use standard implantation techniques, um, actually the, the crystal is damaged quite a bit. Um, this is why in uh, Vukovic lab, um, we have developed this shallow iron implantation and growth technique. So uh, in order to create tin vacancy centers, we start with a high quality electronic grade um, diamond. And then we use uh, quite low implantation energy here of only uh, on the order of one kilovolt um, to mitigate this, uh, this crystal damage that I mentioned. And the ions are actually implanted only within two nanometers of the surface. Um, since color centers that close to the surface typically don't have a good properties, we actually um, overgrow um, the implanted layer with high diamond quality material, uh, with high quality diamond material, um, which effectively leads to a delta doping. If you combine this technique with a PMMA implantation mask, and here again, you benefit from the low implantation energy. So a thin PMMA mask actually uh, stops all of the ions um, and to, and, uh, to reach um, the diamond. You can actually have a very strong three-dimensional confinement. And using this technique here in the confocal scan, you see that uh, people in, in Vukovic lab have actually um, yeah, kind of uh, recreated the, this, this nice um, logo here. Um, as a next step, uh, we fabricate our devices. Here, again, uh, using diamond is difficult. You don't, like in other materials, you don't have a sacrificial layer. So you need to come up with other techniques to, to get like freestanding photonic structures. And we adapted a technique which was pioneered at, uh, um, in Calgary in Paul Barclay's group, uh, which is based on isotropic undercut. So similarly to other techniques, you, you first um, you start with again with your, your diamond, you, you create the SMV centers, and then we use silicon nitride as a hard mask, which we then uh, pattern with uh, Fox resist um, to, to kind of structure our photonic crystals. Then we transfer the pattern uh, first into the hard mask and then into diamond using inductively coupled uh, reactive ion etching. Then to undercut the diamond as the next step, we protect the side wall with a thin layer of aluminum oxide, which we deposit via atomic layer deposition. Uh, we then remove the aluminum oxide in the horizontal planes, um, etch deeper into the diamond, and then uh, we apply an isotropic reactive ion etching. So basically without any bias, 
to undercut the devices. And based on uh, um, like direction, crystal, crystal orientation dependent edge rates, you can then undercut um, the device. In order to uh, get the right thickness, we actually do this undercutting process stepwise and we use um, electron microscopy to assess the diamond thickness. So here you can see an image where we use um, high acceleration voltage FEM uh, in kind of a, a poor man's TEM mode. So we can look through the aluminum oxide layer and we clearly see um, our diamond here. So this would be at a step where we reach the, the target thickness of around 200 nanometers. Um, we also use uh, focus ion beam uh, cutting to, to um, look at the cross section of our device to verify that we have vertical sidewalls um, in order to, to get high Q factors. Um, using this fabrication techniques, uh, people in, in Vukovic lab have previously fabricated these uh, waveguides with in, incorporated SNV centers, and they have um, shown that um, thin vacancy centers in nanostructures can also exhibit very narrow lines. So in a uh, fast single uh, line scan is approaching the lifetime limit of uh, 30 megahertz, where if you um, integrate um, for longer time, you, you get like broadening due to spectral diffusion by a factor of about five. So next, um, we set out to fabricate uh, photonic crystal cavity. So um, based on, on these diamond waveguides, uh, we create one dimensional photonic crystals by, by pattern here, patterning an array of holes. And we use um, tapering of, of the mirror period to confine the light. So here in an FDDD simulation, you, you can see that the light is confined to a very small uh, mode volume. And here's an FEM of an actual device. So after fabricating a, a large matrix of, of devices uh, varying um, different parameters to, to get the right resonance frequency, um, we perform transmission measurements by coupling a broadband source into our grading coupler and measuring the transmission. And here's an example of one of the devices which actually shows um, a wavelength which is blue shifted with respect to the thin vacancy transition at, at about 619 nanometers. And this is important because um, we use gas adsorption as a tuning mechanism. So um, I should probably mention that all of our experiments are performed in a closed cycle um, cryos that is a base temperature of, of five Kelvin. And using like by flowing argon gas, and, gas into our cryostat, we can deposit like a thin layer of argon ice and that shifts our cavities to, to longer wavelengths. So we use um, such a cavity and as the next step, we perform uh, photoluminescence measurements. So we basically excite uh, the tin vacancy center non-resonantly and uh, we by shining like a green laser in the center of our cavity also to verify that the tin vacancy is, is located where the field is confined. Um, you see such a measurement on this slide here. So the heat map shows a stack of uh, subsequent PL measurements. So here um, um, we, have, we have several spectra where over time we tune the, the cavity uh, mode. So you, this faint line that you can see here is actually the cavity mode and these uh, bright transitions are the transitions of um, the tin vacancy. So here again, a sketch of the level scheme. So you see actually the transitions from the lower um, excited state to the two orbital ground states. Um, and if we compare two line cuts here off resonant to a line cut on resonant, we see an about 44 uh, increase of the emission intensity. Um, we also perform a saturation measurement and compare um, off-resonant uh, counts to on-resonant counts. Um, and here you can see that actually um, the power, the non-resonant power we can um, apply is limited to about uh, a milliwatt because of, um, as power is above that, the argon ice uh, starts to melt and the cavity um, is blue shifting. Um, we also perform autocorrelation measurements by uh, filtering the, the C transition with a, a monochromator to um, confirm that we actually see single photon emission. Um, to characterize our cavity and, and um, assess the properties, as a next step, we perform a lifetime measurement. So for, for these measurements, instead of using a continuous wave a non-resonant laser, we apply um, a pulse non-resonant laser. And then we measure the time results for the luminescence for different cavity detunings. So this is what you see here. The yellow line um, is the lifetime measurement for uh, when the cavity is um, blue detuned with respect to the C transition. So we always focus on the C transition here and filter this, the emission by a monochromator, as I said before. And now when you tune the, the cavity by absorbing uh, argon ice, um, you can see that the radiative recombination rate increases and the lifetime uh, decreases. And on resonance, we, actually, we find um, about a factor of 10 
a decrease in lifetime from uh, seven nanoseconds to about 0.7 nanoseconds, uh, which corresponds to um, a radiative recombination rate on resonance of, of uh, 1.44 uh, per nanosecond. Um, so the cavity induced um, um, emission rate or the, the additional emission rate um, based on, on cavity coupling, coupling you can see here. And actually with these numbers that we all extract uh, from this nice Laurentian uh, dependence of the cavity enhancement, uh, we can calculate um, all of the relevant cavity parameters. So the overall per cell enhancement, which is given by the rate of emission into the cavity compared to the off resonant rate um, is, is nine, which corresponds to a lifetime reduction of 10 actually. Um, but you have to consider that we only enhance the C transition. So you have to um, kind of uh, um, take into account this uh, Xi uh, factor of the C transition, which is a combination or product of the quantum efficiency, the debye valor factor, and the branching ratio of the C transition. And um, from these parameters, you can also infer that uh, more than 90% of the light is actually, so after exciting the, the thin vacancy center, more than 90% of the light is channeled into the C transition um, and into the cavity mode. Um, so as next steps, um, we, we plan to confirm um, these uh, long spin coherence times that have been reported at temperatures above one Kelvin. So we want to combine spin driving with our device um, another thing that we need to confirm is that um, in, in these photonic crystal devices, we also do have a narrow spectral diffusion, but since we saw it in the waveguide, um, we, we think that um, that should be achievable. Um, um, a very important thing is actually to improve the light collection efficiency. So the beta factor that I stated is like emission into the cavity mode, but not into the waveguide. So um, as the previous speaker has said, this is very important and you can achieve this by uh, critically coupling the cavity, which, which essentially means that the transmission through one of the mirrors, I mean, if this, this was a photonic crystal, needs to be the dominant um, decay channel. And uh, then once the light is coupled into the waveguide, if you want to use the devices in a fiber network, you need to get efficient extraction from the waveguide. So this can be done here by either using um, optimized inversely designed grading couplers, which are combined with an aluminum mirror, or another method is to use an, a, the adiabatic transfer of light uh, by tapering the diamond waveguide and applying one of these optical fiber tapers. Um, another important ingredient is actually to implement a tuning mechanism. So I said before, these color centers don't have a permanent dipole moment. Um, so it's actually very difficult to tune them. So for NV centers, typically stark tuning is, is applied, um, which um, for these kind of color centers is, is expected to be very small. But um, as I mentioned before, also, the spread of optical transition frequencies is small. So even a small range uh, star tuning might be helpful. Um, so there are um, results on this reported in Dirk Englund's group at MIT. And we also um, preparing, or we, we also have some results which we will put on archive soon. Um, another way to tune the emitters is by uh, employing electromechanical tuning. Here, basically a gate electrode is, is deposited onto the waveguide and onto the diamond. And by applying a, a waveguide, uh, by applying a voltage, you can apply controlled strain and uh, shift the energies um, that way. Um, with that, um, I want to summarize. So uh, we have done, demonstrated the uh, successful fabrication of uh, one-dimensional photonic crystal cavities um, and the coupling of SNV centers, which were created with a, a shallow ion implantation and growth technique. Um, we have shown an intensity enhancement of the C transition by a factor of about 40, a lifetime reduction by a factor of 10, which corresponds to pressure enhancement by a factor of 25. Uh, more than 90% of the light is channeled into the cavity mode, which, uh, as I mentioned before, um, we will work on, on actually extracting um, in the next generation of our devices. And one very important fact is also that by uh, reducing the lifetime by a factor of 10, also the lifetime limited line width is increasing uh, to uh, more than 200 megahertz, which is, which is actually a factor of two larger than the broadening um, that was previously reported in waveguard. So, um, yeah, that points at the fact that spectral diffusion is, is not a limiting factor. Um, and before I conclude, I want to acknowledge my co-workers here, people in, in Vukovic lab that um, were part, part of this work and uh, uh, um, the group of Professor Shen and Professor Melosh who have grown um, our diamond samples and the rest of the group. And, and I wanna thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for this very good talk. Actually, there are a few questions. Uh, the first one by Alejandro González Tudela that says, with your method, 
can you place more than one single team vacancy in your cavity? If so, will you have deterministic control over positions? With which precision? Yeah, so this has actually been shown before by, as I mentioned in my uh, introduction. So here for SIV centers, people have used a uh, focused ion beam implantation. And, but this is, this is possible because you can implant uh, SIVs deeper into the crystal. And yeah, the answer is yes, you can have more than one emitter uh, in, um, in one device. Uh, of course, the obvious way is focused ion beam uh, implantation, but in the, our approach is actually to do um, post implantation. So we kind of fabricate the devices and then uh, apply our PMMA layer. And then we should also have like sub 10 nanometer precision. Or another way would be to first create an array of, of emitters and then align to an aligned right of the devices. So this should certainly be possible. And by changing like the implantation dose, you can kind of control how many, how many emitters are on average, at least uh, in, in one device. Okay, there is one question by Francisco Garcia Vidal that says, what is the main advantage of all these vacancy centers with respect to using quantum dots as we saw in the second talk? Yeah, so actually for that, um, in, in terms of photonics, I don't think there's any advantage. So quantum dots are clearly superior, like the strength of, of these color centers is clearly their spin property. As, as was shown in the previous um, talk, like the coherence times are extremely long, they're on, on the order of seconds. And you also have this nice resource of having these adjacent uh, nuclear spins. And, and one of the main reasons is basically because the host material is, doesn't have any nuclear spin. And also diamond has a, a small spin orbit coupling. So if you Compared to quantum dots, it's like a 3-5 material. So you have a lot of uh, nuclear spins, and there the coherence times are very uh, limited. Okay, and then we have time for one more question. That is by Benjamin Pingol. That says, that, what is the impact of the shallow implantation and nanofabrication on the strain of the silicon uh, of the team vacancy centers? Yeah, so um, we... In, in, in uh, the, this re result where we show the waveguides, we actually have a relatively large uh, um, inhomogeneous distribution of transition frequencies. So it's on the order of 100 gigahertz. But we believe that by improving our fabrication, we should get down to values that were reported for SIV centers, so which is on the order of, of 10 gigahertz. So it's still a, a small spread. But then, um, as, I, as I also mentioned, one of the main problems is actually to tune several centers into resonance. So you need kind of a yeah, tens of gigahertz tuning range, ideally, to, to get indistinguishable um, photons. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. So we move on to the next talk that is uh, going to be presented by Ilan Slinger on the efficiently shaping and storing of single photons with a tunable subradiant state. Uh, yes, thank you, Luis. Yes. Do you see my presentation? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So today, yeah, I'm going to present some work that I did during my uh, PhD. So actually, currently, I'm at AMOV doing my uh, postdoc. This is a work I did in Institut d'Optique at uh, Palaiso, next to Paris. And it was done uh, in the group of Jean-Jacques Greffet and uh, in collaboration with uh, Pascal Sonelard and uh, and Loic Lanco. And uh, basically, what I want to, so it's a theoretical work that uh, we want to see how to shape uh, the single photon emission of uh, this kind of sources. So you had already a good introduction of, uh, of the single photon sources. So basically, there, there's three families of single photon sources the ones that are parametric down conversion. Uh, ones that just guide the single photon emission and the one we're focusing on today it's uh, and that we've seen in, in different talks is this uh, personal enhanced sources where the idea is to enhance the emission of a photon into a single mode. So these, uh, these uh, sources as, we, as we've seen they rely on placing an emitter in the cavity and basically working in the Purcell regime where uh, you enhance the coupling of the emitter with the cavity mode. And you have also a weak, uh, also a bad cavity uh, regime where you want this photon to be emitted quickly through the cavity. Uh, so this is characterized by this uh, mode coupling beta factor that we've seen also. 
and it's uh, written as a as a ratio of the of the emission into the cavity mode compared to the total emission. So the fact, personal factor divided by personal factor plus one. And uh, yeah, what one problem that we want to tackle uh, with this uh, project was uh, the fact that in the, this kind of sources, you have a fixed bandwidth once you have fabricated the, the source. So uh, this is given by the by your by your, your line width of your emitter times your your personal factor. But once you have this, you cannot change it anymore. So you cannot tune the the bandwidth, and uh, you cannot change the, the emission. Uh, well, one uh, possibility would be to detune the, the emitter from the cavity mode. And at the end, what you are doing is just exploring the elders of the cavity mode. But the problem is that when you detune the emitter, you just change the, the personal enhancement, but you don't change the, the emission into the, the other modes. So at the end, you're just lowering your efficiency. And uh, what we want to, what I'm going to show today is that if you use two, emitters um, coupled by dipole-dipole interaction. This could be a solution for this, meaning that you can have uh, a tunal, tunable bandwidth with a constant emission. So what we're going to see is uh, two emitters that are going to be modeled by uh, two level systems coupled by dipole-dipole interaction. So dipole-dipole interaction is just basically the interaction, the near field interaction of, the, of one dipole. Uh, with the uh, field created by the other dipole. And this scales as a uh, one over R cube. So it's uh, just uh, near field interactions. Uh, previous uh, demonstrations and theoretical work have, have, have focused on the, of, yeah, of, of multiple atoms in cavities, have focused on uh, just long range coupling through the mode of the, of the cavity. But there has been a very a few works uh, some theoretical work uh, looking at these uh, dipole dipole couple emitters in a cavity and no demonstration because as we're going to see at the end, it's uh, pretty challenging also in the experimental way. Uh, so yeah, so as a difference from the previous demonstrations, what we see is that what we're going to explore is this, the influence of this dipole dipole coupling into uh, the emission of the single photons. And this is more or less what uh, we're going to show. So first of all, we're going to study the subradiant state that is created by this dipole-dipole uh, emission. And then we're going to see that by, by using the subradiant state, we don't change the, the efficiency. We keep a high efficiency. And at the end, we're going to discuss the, well, the applications of this and how challenging it is to uh, implement it. So first, just describe the, the coupling of uh, two dipoles uh, coupled by, by, well, two emitter, two two-level systems coupled by dipole, dipole interaction. So when they're close together, they couple and create, they're described by new eigenstates, which are just a, a symmetric and anti-symmetric eigenstates that you can see as uh, two dipoles in resonance or in phase opposition, so in phase or in phase opposition. And when you see the emission rates of these new eigenstates, uh, so there's one, the symmetric state is going to interfere constructively in the emission and you're going to have an enhanced, sorry, there's, oh yeah, there's a plus here. The, you have a, an enhanced emission compared to the single emitter case by this gamma one, two. And the anti-symmetric state is just, it is going to have an emission that is inhibited by the interference of, this, uh, of these two dipoles. And this, this new rate, this difference, minus gamma one, two, or plus gamma one, two, is just imaginary part of this, uh, actually, this green tensor of the one dipole on the other. And this scales uh, as, a, as a, yeah, one, well, as it's written here, but for very small distances, it's very close to the gamma of the single uh, emitter. So you basically, for two emitters that are very close together, the anti-symmetric state is going to be a dark state, and the symmetric state is going to be a bright state, emitting twice as fast as a single emitter. So this is not good for us, because we want still to emit photons and, and be able to control it. So what we see now is if you have these two same emitters, but now they are slightly detuned, but detuned with a difference of frequency that is still comparable to this uh, dipole-dipole coupling here, 
What you have is also new eigenstates that we call now effective anti-symmetric and symmetric uh, states. And these states are written as a superposition of this, uh, of the previous collective states. So you have this new subgradient state, which is going to be mainly a dark state, but is, is going to have a uh, small component of a bright state here. And the interesting uh, part is that this uh, small bright component is going to be, uh, is going to give some uh, emission possibility of to this uh, subradiant state. So it's not going to be completely dark state. It's going to emit, and this emission rate is going to depend on the detuning of these two uh, uh, emitters. So you see where I'm going now. It's just that by playing with the difference of frequency of these two emitters, you can uh, change the emission of the, the emission rate of this subradiant state. And the more specifically here, what I plot is just the components of this subradiant, effective subradiant state. So basically, when you are at uh, zero detuning, you're in the dark state. But once you have a difference of frequency, you insert a certain component here of, of bright state to this effective state, and it starts. It is possible to emit. So this is what are, we're going to use as a platform to change the emission rate of the of the of our emitters or of our system. And, uh, and what is interesting is that when we're changing this detuning here, the emission into the cavity is also going to uh, scale as this new emission uh, rate, this modified emission rate here. And so when we look at the mode coupling efficiency, what we get at the end is uh, this fraction here, the same ratio as the beginning. But instead of having a constant gamma here as before, we're going to have something that also scales as a, as a new emission rate into the leaky modes. And basically, at the end, we have a, uh, the same mode coupling, whatever uh, the, the tuning is. So this is a system we're going to play with this uh, difference of frequency. And we see that actually this subgradient states is going to act as a, actually, instead of having two emitters, it's going to act as a single emitter with a tunable dipole. And this, and by tuning the dipole, you don't change the the mode coupling. So it's uh, you're just you have a single dipole, but you can change the rate at which it emits both into into the leaky modes. But what inter what is most interesting is the rate that it emits into the cavity mode. Uh, yeah. So putting the cavity on resonance to this subradiant state. So what we can see. Uh, this is the first uh, simulation uh, result of this. When you do just a simple simulate a simple uh, reflection experiment, uh, where you tune the laser that you're shining into your cavity with your subradiant state, and you look at your at your system as a function of the detuning, you see that with zero detuning, you only see the dip of the cavity plus one resonance of the one eigenstate, which is the symmetric state. This is for zero detuning. Once you put some detuning, then your this gray state that we want to use appears as a very narrow feature, and but very um, with a high contrast, which is also due to this high mode coupling uh, being constant at the end. So we're going to play with this detuning here to go from one uh, from a dark state to a gray state that we can control and with high efficiency. Uh, so to be more quantitative, the, the line width of this new subradiant state, we can calculate it as a function of this detuning that we are playing with, so the difference of frequency. And it's, going, it's uh, actually going to go from zero at uh, zero tuning and then as a function, uh, the more we detune the two emitters, the more they're going to be in phase opposition, and the more, the more they, they're going to tend to behave as a single emitter. So you can span basically the the range from zero to uh, the personal uh, rate enhancement rate of a single emitter. So you can play with this this whole whole range here. And at the same time, I plot the beta, so the mode coupling factor when we're changing this. And we see that it remains mostly constant with a small uh, 
decrease that is due to the fact that we are still, although we're just playing with the, the tuning between, the, between these, the two emitters, we're, we're still changing the frequency of the this subrating state compared to the cavity. So it, it's still changing the frequency a little bit, but has a much less influence or impact that what you would have with a single emitter, just changing the frequency of a single emitter. Um, yeah, so the applications of this, first the tunable bandwidth as we saw and we're gonna see next, but we, you can also change this uh, difference of frequency in time during the emission by just, uh, yeah, detuning these two. And this is going to uh, enable us to shape the emission and also to store and re-emit the single photons. <clears throat> so the tunable bandwidth first application here is that if you start with the, yeah, we suppose that we start with uh, this uh, anti-symmetric state. We're gonna see how to start with this afterwards. But if you suppose that we have this at the beginning, you manage to excite them on an uh, anti-symmetric superposition. So the detuning is zero. They're both at the same frequency. And then you, you put a detuning be between the two. They're go both gonna emit. And depending on how detuned they are, the, the emission is going to be faster or slower. Basically, the intensity is gonna fo follow the, your emission rate. And uh, yeah, and if you just see the spectrum of this, you see that you can tune the bandwidth from very narrow bandwidth to a larger bandwidth with basically a, 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 the same efficiency. <clears throat> yeah, and if you tune to, during the emission, we do the same thing. We start with a, a anti-symmetric state and we apply some detunings, but then we open the emission and close it before the whole state has been emitted. And basically what you can see is that you can produce, uh, yeah, emit the photon in different time bins, uh, very separated in time. And uh, yeah, and, and this can uh, lead, you, uh, lead to uh, this uh, frequency comes on the, on the, of single photons. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, and if, to analyze this even uh, better, you can uh, plot the, the Wigner function of this. So this is a time frequency Wigner function. We just plot the, the intensity as a function of time and as a function of uh, frequency here. So this is a Fourier transform on, uh, in time. And you can see that there's some interference between the same photon. This is a single photon in two time beams interfering with itself. And you can go even beyond uh, you can create compass states or whatever state if you can just change your detuning uh, multiple times before the single photon has been emitted. And the last application that we that we can do with this is actually go in the opposite uh, direction, just uh, store a single photon. So you start with an empty cavity and then you shine a photon on the a single photon on this system that is presented here on this uh, dotted black line. And, uh, and then you change the, the detuning of the, of the two emitters to go from something that interacts with light. So something with, uh, that emits that is partially bright. And when the photon is being absorbed in the system, then you just go to a dark state by putting the two atoms in resonance. And then the photon has been absorbed and it doesn't emit anymore. You can get even uh, until two thirds, well, until 68% with this, uh, with the numbers I've used here, but this is mainly limited by the chirp I already talked about, this, this little change of frequency of this anti-symmetric state. And uh, if we zoom out, the storage, this photon can be stored and it's only been uh, lost due to the, this leakage of the dark state, which is still leaking because the two atoms are not completely uh, dark because they're not uh, exactly at the same position. So this storage time depends on how close the two emitters are. And at some point you can just put a detuning on the two of them and then emit the remaining of the photon. Uh, yeah, and so the this is uh, so to give a more precise idea of how to how this would be implemented in the in real life, so more experimental uh, side. 
So there's different uh, in, important aspects to, to have. So first of all, of course, to have the dipole-dipole uh, interaction, the two emitters need to be very close. So very close means uh, sub-wavelength. And, uh, and here, what I plot is uh, two different uh, values. The storage time in units of uh, the, uh, the natural lifetime of the emitter outside the cavity and also the dipole-dipole coupling. And so this, the, the storage time, uh, of course, yeah, depends on this, on, on the distance. And uh, even for, uh, for emitters that are 20 uh, nanometers apart, which would be a lambda over 12 uh, for any other system, uh, we can have 20 times, uh, yeah, storage time of 20 lifetimes. And this would be even higher compared to the personal enhanced lifetime. So you can really go different orders of magnitude. And, uh, and the, inter the important part of the dipole-dipole coupling, this real part here, is the, just the ro robustness of your system. If the coupling is not strong enough, then any change in frequency due to any uh, yeah, imperfection of the system or drifting is going to uh, destroy your, your, uh, your state. And uh, yeah, ne the nearby emitters have been uh, implemented in different, uh, in different systems. In, in quantum dots, they're really well uh, understood, but they're actually uh, used for quantum dot molecules, but because it's hard to start with two molecules, two quantum dots that are very close in frequency together. So it's easier to uh, obtain quantum dot molecules and, and the coupling is really strong where, when they're very close. But there's also been uh, uh, demonstration of dipole-dipole coupling with the molecules a very uh, long time ago from Fahit and Dogdar's group. Uh, and uh, with other kinds of molecules with TEMs, there's a recent work on this where you see two dipoles and they can see actually all the collective states of multiple dipoles. And uh, as the previous speaker was speaking about, there's nice uh, methods now to Im implant uh, colored centers, for example. So this could be also a nice way to obtain this. Another important point is the dephasing. So the pure def here I all that I've showed is without dephasing. And actually, everything is limited by, by this coherence uh, time. So because as, uh, as soon as uh, one of the two emitters has, has a dephasing process, it, lo it loses its coherence. And the, the couple state is not. Uh, yeah, it's not uh, collective anymore. So they just behave as single emitters. So what I showed here is if you start with dark state and you put, uh, for example, a dephasing that is equal to the uh, emission rate of a single emitter, then your dark state is just going to emit at this rate. And everything that you do is just limited by this dephasing rate. And the last point is uh, external control. I've been talking about tuning the, the frequency of the two emitters. So of course, what you need is something to be able to change the frequency of the two. So you can use electrical or optical start shifts, which are really well uh, understood now and uh, used uh, in this, uh, yeah, in the progress that has been made in these sources. But what we need here on top of this is uh, to control the tuning between the two, not just the two frequencies, but the, the difference of the frequencies. And you need controls that are less or on the order of 10 lifetimes and faster than the emission rate. Otherwise, you cannot do anything during the emission. Uh, so fast controls has been done also with quantum dots or even tuning two quantum dots uh, on the same frequency has also been realized already uh, with photonic crystals in a photonic crystal cavity. But the quantum dots were very far apart. Uh, yeah, these are already talked about. and. Uh, yeah, you can also use molecules, for example, DPT, and nice realizations of huge dark shifts have been done with the uh, 2D materials and DPT. And this leads me to the conclusion of the work. So just working, uh, yeah, introducing this new degree of freedom of uh, this subradiant state that behaves as a two-level system, as a single two-level system with tunable dipole, with a very, well, quite a few challenges to, to tackle, but since the progress in these sources has been uh, huge in the last few years, it could be done. And uh, yeah, this is a table with some reference of sources that can be, could be used if, uh, for
for this implementation that is in the in this article. Thank you for it, your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Ilan. We have time for a couple of questions. There is one by Alejandro González Tudela that says very nice talk. He has a technical question uh, that says, shouldn't the condition that the distance between emitters much smaller than the wavelength change, change when the frequencies between emitters are different? In that case, one has a different lambda for the optical transition of the two emitters. So which lambda should one use? And he said that sometimes he has seen in the literature that they use an average one, but never saw a proper justification. Have you thought about this? Uh, sorry, I, I lost the question. Can you repeat, please? Sorry. Yeah, I, I think is that you say that the, the condition is that the distance should be much smaller than, than the wavelength. Yeah. But because you have two uh, frequencies, Alejandro is wondering whether this uh, there may be some regime where you enter uh, one condition where the distance is smaller than one wavelength but not than the other. So, uh, yeah, this could be an interesting point. But uh, here I'm using really small uh, uh, changes in in frequencies compared to the to the wavelength itself. So it's uh, I guess it should be the, the mean frequency that you should use between the two because it's still a couple state and then. Yeah, they're, they're acting as a really collective state, but uh, the, the difference on, on frequency is, the, is in the order here of uh, omega one, two of this dipole dipole coupling. And this dipole dipole coupling is really small compared to the, uh, to the, to the wavelength. Okay, there is another question by Joaquin Gimbao, but I think that was posed before you talk about the, uh, about the, <clears throat> About the defacing, so probably that is already answered. There's one question by uh, Andre Pescher that says, if you tune the emitters with a, within a fraction of their lifetime, how sensitive is the phase accumulated during the tuning to the exact waveform used for the tuning? Uh, yeah, how sensitive is the the phase of the emitted photon on the on the difference? That's the question, right? The phase accumulated during the tuning to the exact waveform wave used for the tuning. Uh, that's a yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so the wave, yeah, the way the the wave front of your of the, the photon is 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 going to follow the the gate. Well, the yeah, the, the tuning you apply. Not, I mean, not completely linearly. There's a the dependence. Yeah, it's it's. I wouldn't. I couldn't say it like this. It's a, uh, yeah. yeah. You can have some exchange uh, by. Yeah. by okay. Sure. And think about this. And this the last uh, question is by Matt Christensen. That says, does the scheme allow for both broadening and narrowing of the photon, or just one of the two? Yeah, so you can, so basically you can narrow it more than the single emitter, but not broaden it because I'm using here, I'm basically starting using only the, the sub radiant state, which is by definition like more sub radiant, more less radiant than the, the emitter. So to broaden it, you should use the, the, the other state, the, the super radiant state, but then you cannot go from one to the other easily. So, so it's just shortening. That's why you should use only high uh well yeah the best would be to use uh, high emitters like fast emitters like quantum dots uh, uh mainly that would be nice to to be able to go to 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 all the other ranges because if you start with a very high rate emission uh, uh, uh emitter then you can tune and go and interface with other systems that have low lower emission rate Okay, there is another question, but uh, I think we have to move on. So please have a, a, a look at the chat and maybe you can answer uh, this other question. Okay. okay. But, uh, thank you very much. The next uh, talk is going to be by Carlos Gonzalez Ballestero. It is entitled Towards a Quantum Interface Between Spin Waves and Paramagnetic Spin Baths. So, uh, Carlos. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, thanks, Luis. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos Gonzalez Ballestero. I am a senior postdoc in uh, University of Innsbruck. And uh, at the last minute, I decided to just change the title to something more catchy. So today, I'm going to talk to you about a recent theoretical work, which we entitled uh, Spin Steered Magnonics, which is a bit cryptic, but I promise you it will make sense in a minute. So just to give you a, a global vision, this talk is really uh, closely related to the well-known capability of steering light with ensembles of uh, emitters. So uh, as you know, when you, have, uh, when you couple an electromagnetic wave in general to an ensemble of dipole emitters, they can be just classical dipoles or quantum emitters, uh, you can exert large modifications by controlling the ensemble of emitters on how the light propagates. You can mold the flow of light. And two of the most famous examples are slow light, where the group velocity of light is set up to zero, so you basically can stop uh, light poles. Or backward waves, where you can basically switch the sign of the group velocity so that you have uh, a wave in which group velocity and phase velocity point in different directions. Now, uh, notice that I say here electromagnetic wave and not uh, light, because actually this principle of coupling light to a collective ensemble of, of emitters can be applied to any electromagnetic wave. And in particular in this talk, what I'm going to focus on is on applying this to uh, a particular wave called spin waves. And I will tell you why in a minute, but let me first tell you what spin waves are. So spin waves are usually introduced as uh, uh, magnetization waves, okay? So consider you have a, magnet, a magnetic material, either a ferromagnet or some material you can magnetize. Then we apply uh, some static magnetic field that is high enough so that the magnetization saturates. This means that all the spins in the material are pointing in the same direction. Then on top of this fully magnetized configuration, you will have fluctuations of the magnetization that propagate and we call that spin waves, okay? Uh, now, as I said, these waves are usually introduced in terms of magnetization, but they're actually fully electromagnetic waves. They have a magnetic field component and an electric field component and Maxwell's equations are involved in obtaining these spin waves. Okay, so in this sense, these are similar to light, just at the complexity of a magnetic material. So in the different sections of this talk, I'm going to try to answer any que the questions, the basic questions that anyone hearing this from the first time might have. First one is, okay, what, okay, I know what spin waves are, but why are they important? And why would I like to steer or to mold the flow of spin waves? Then I'm going to show you uh, in a very short uh, couple of slides, uh, summarize the theory we use to prove that you can do this. And then I'm going to show you how we can really strongly and tunably modify the propagation of spin waves. And then after my conclusions, I hope to have time to give you uh, my personal outlook on this field, which I think is super exciting for, for any person working in nanophotonics. Okay, so let me start with uh, spin waves and why are they important? And as I spoiled in the, in the title, the, the, re the answer is new technologies, okay? So uh, if you ask anybody working on uh, spin waves or magnonics as they call it, they will tell you immediately that spin waves are extremely good candidates for information processing. And in particular, they are much better than electronic currents that we use right now in electronics. Um, and this is enabled by a series of properties that are quite unique, such as uh, tunable spectrum. So spin waves has, have a spectrum in the gigahertz to terahertz range, but you can tune this spectrum. Uh, you can move it up and down in the energy scale using a magnetic field. They have much lower losses than electronic currents that in principle would enable for technology that consumes much lower power. They have quite complex behavior as compared to, for instance, photons. And also as compared to photons, they have a stronger linearity, which is also crucial because nonlinearity is an important component for a necessary component for information processing. Uh, and furthermore, they are waves, which makes some people think that they can be used to define a new complete, a complete new set of electronics beyond the Boolean set of gates that we use in, in, uh, in electronic information processing. Okay, so this, all these properties are very nice, but we are not building our dreams only on properties. It's actually the, the, the implementation and the optimization of spin wave devices, what people call magnetic devices, is happening right now. So in the last five years, we have seen uh, cascaded devices. We have seen repeaters, memories for spin waves, even complex operations like transistors, majority gates, and full uh, chips. There have been proofs of principle of prime factorization using spin waves and many more. <clears throat> so the combination of these nice properties and all the technology that is available right now makes spin waves, uh, for many people, number one candidates for beyond more information processing. 
Okay, and here I show you an example. This is uh, the IRDS, the International Roadmap for Devices and Systems in the 2020 edition. They basically list spin wave devices as the first candidate for substituting electronics in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. Okay. Okay, so even though all this progress sounds very fancy, there's still some milestones that have not been achieved. And in particular, all the spin wave devices that are out there are lacking some flexibility. And in particular, the possibility of really molding and controlling the flow of spin waves as we do with light <clears throat> is something that has not been achieved. And here's what I think nanophotonics can enter and raise a hand and hey, here we have developed in along many years, a way of molding the flow of waves. And this is just coupling these with quantum emitters. So why don't we couple the spin waves with quantum emitters? So this is the idea we are working, wanting to pursue, trying to couple spin waves with quantum emitters. Uh, also, unfortunately, this is a very good time because uh, it uh, now <coughs> it has been clarified that the best uh, uh, quantum emitters to couple to spin waves are solid state paramagnetic spins, such as, such as MV centers. The reason is these are highly controllable. You can control them with microwave fields or via optical pumping, which gives you a lot of handles to mold, uh, could give you a lot of handles to mold the propagation of spin waves. They can couple to spin waves. It's of course a nice requisite. Um, and finally, they have already been used. So these ensembles of MV centers have already been used for uh, spin wave detection, such as for instance, in this experiment by uh, our collaborator, uh, Professor Van der Saar in, in TU Delft, where they basically uh, image spin waves through the magnetic field dependent uh, uh, fluorescence of the MV centers. Here's the experimental image. So, so the stage is all set for us or for someone to try and ask the question, okay, can one use ensembles of paramagnetic spins to mold the flow of spin waves? And this is basically what we have baptized spin steered magnetics and what we present in this theoretical work. Uh, so let me just summarize for you the theory uh, of uh, the theoretical framework we are using. <clears throat> so first of all, this is the system we are considering. We are considering a thin film configuration. This is an infinitely extended film of some thickness of magnetic material. We apply a static magnetic field B0, which will be an important parameter as you will see in a minute, which is parallel to the, to the field. And uh, on top of this uh, film, we have, uh, we assume um, we place a slab of diamond containing an ensemble of quantum emitters, in particular of nitrogen magnetic centers. We assume the simplest possible configuration for the MV centers. We assume they are independent. They don't interact. They are at random positions. And the only simplifying assumption is that they are all have the dipole moment parallel to the magnetic field. Uh, we also assume, and this also will be important, that the MV centers can or cannot be optically pumped. And I remind you, optical pumping is just a dissipative process by which we can initialize the, spin, the, the nitrogen back as the centers in the ground state. And just as a disclaimer, so that if you know about the system in, in, in advance, you might ask, I'm going to show results for just a single spin wave band. There are many bands in this, in this structure. I just focus on one because of simplicity, but my, our results extend to all of the bands. Okay, so we want to develop a theory, a quantum theory of uh, describing this couple system. So how do we go about it? The first thing we do is we calculate the spin wave eigenmodes of this film and we quantize them. And I sadly cannot get into the details, but if you are a, a big fan of these uh, tricky mathematical details, ask me because there's a lot of tricks on how, how to quantize the spin waves. But after you go through all these tricks, you find a Hamiltonian that is very familiar. We have just a sum over K and this K is a wave vector. It's a two-dimensional vector. It's the propagation, the propagation wave vector in the parallel plane. And then we have bosonic creation and annihilation operators for spin waves. Then you just write the Hamiltonian of each MV center. You don't really derive it because we know what it is. So um, we know that the ground state manifold of MV centers is just a three-level system with a ground state which we label, label zero and two excited states, minus and plus, with their frequencies omega minus and omega plus. And these states are in general split in the presence of a magnetic field just by semen splitting. Uh, so the Hamiltonian looks uh, basically uh, like this. Um, so, okay, next, uh, the next step is to calculate the coupling of each MV center to the spin waves. And this coupling is just simply given by the formula line for the magnetic dipole interaction, where mu is the magnetic dipole operator of the MV center, and B is the magnetic field produced by the spin waves at the position of the MV center. 
So after you work with this a bit and do a rotating wave approximation, it turns out you can write this coupling in a fairly simple way. We have a sum over all the spin wave modes of some coupling G and then terms of the James Cummings form where you destroy and quantum mox of a spin wave by raising uh, uh, the state of the NB center from the state zero to the state minus. And I want to point out that in this particular case, after rotating wave approximation, one of these, uh, the state plus of the NB center completely uncoupled. So we can assume these NB centers are uh, qubits in this case, not always. Um, okay, so now we have the Hamiltonian for the three components. The next step is to just extend to an ensemble of MV centers. Here was just for one, and then write a total master equation, which will be a fundamental equation to begin with, which looks like this. So you have a time derivative of rho. This is the density matrix describing both the spin waves and the MV centers. And it has a coherent component, okay, which uh, contains the Hamiltonian the three Hamiltonians plus the interaction, and then three dissipative terms, which describe the spin wave damping, the nitrogen vacancy decay and defacing, and potentially optical pumping in case we are interested in optically pumping. Uh, and finally, the fifth and last step is to now trace out the nitrogen vacancy centers. Okay, so we want to really see how the back action of the MV centers modifies the propagation of spin waves. We don't care about the particular details of the MV centers. So what we do is use the projection operator techniques to derive a master equation only for the density matrix of the spin waves, which now contains a modified Hamiltonian, H prime, and a modified dissipator. So if you look into this expression for this Hamiltonian dissipator, you find out that basically the whole effect of the nitrogen vacancy center ensemble on the spin waves in this particularly simple configuration is to induce a frequency shift, delta k, for all spin waves, and a modification of the line width. So the original line width, gamma k, is shifted or is modified by a, by a factor, capital gamma k. Okay, good. So what can we do with just these, these two ingredients, this modification of the frequency and of the line width? So to show it to you, let me focus on the modification of the line width because the, the, the frequency shift is quite similar. And we have derived analytical expressions for this, but because they are a bit involved, I just put gonna uh, show you the crucial dependencies, which are these ones. And there are three uh, uh, factors I want you to, to notice. The first one is this row and V, which is the density of nitrogen vacancy centers. The second factor is this Lorentzian uh, function, which has this gamma k, which I remind you is the bare line width of the spin waves. And then we have a resonance condition, which maximizes the Lorentzian factor when the spin wave, for spin waves, omega k, which are resonant with the transition of the MV center. And last but not least, we have an occupation factor, which describes the difference between the occupation of the excited and the ground state of the MV center in the steady state. Okay, now I won't get into the details, but it turns out that um, this is just to remind you of the geometry. It turns out that this uh, uh, line width modification is maximized for spin waves that are resonant. It's already said, I already said, and for spin waves that are propagating perpendicularly to the applied field. Okay, so in, like exactly like in this figure, these spin waves, if you are interested, are called Damon Eschbach modes. So I will focus on these modes from now on. Now, what is really, really important uh, about these three factors and why do I show them to you is that these three factors allow to tune the line width modification. Okay, and in particular, we can tune the modification of the line width via modifying the density of MV centers by tuning the magnetic field which moves these frequencies around or via optical pumping with, uh, with breaks the thermal equilibrium between these populations. So this is what I'm going to show you uh, in the next slides. <clears throat> so first let's look at, at how this um, line width modification looks like and how can we change it with the effect of the with the static field P0. So again, I remind you that what we are modifying by moving the, the strength of the magnetic field is just this resonance condition because both the spin wave frequency and the frequency of the uh, qubit transition or the emitter transition depends on the magnetic field. Uh, so this is how this uh, <clears throat> line width modification looks like for a particular magnetic field of 25 millitesla. You have basically the only sharp feature here which corresponds to this Lorentzian factor. Uh, and as I, you will see that as I turn down the magnetic field, I basically shift the impact or this, the, the peak of this Lorentzian to higher and higher wave vectors. I have this horizontal axis shows the wave vector of the spin waves in units of, of one over the thickness of the film. And they span quite a, a large range. So this in itself is interesting in that the fact that we can shift the resonance condition to different spin waves, which means that I can tune in which, which spin waves are affected more or less by my uh, 
uh, nitrogen vacancy center ensemble. But what is important uh, about this is uh, comparing the shift of the line width with the bare line width of the spin waves, okay? And in particular, if the shift induced is smaller than the line width of the spin waves, it would be a negligible shift. So what we do is we just draw a line at the typical uh, line width of the spin waves, which is about one megahertz. And what you, we see from here is that almost none of the spin waves are affected significantly by the MV center ensemble, only the spin waves really, really close to this maximum are. And from this, we can conclude that uh, uh, by tuning the magnetic field B0, we can really basically select the very narrow frequency range of spin waves we affect, okay? So this is the first knob that we have to tune the propagation of spin waves. First, we can tune which spin waves we want to, uh, to affect. The second knob we have is optical pumping, which I told you uh, I can also modify the uh, propagation properties. And in particular, the optical pump will modify the populations of the uh, um, MV center uh, internal states. Uh, in particular, if you plug the numbers at room temperature thermal equilibrium, this, this factor will be about 10 to the minus four. And the reason is that the frequency difference between these two states is much more than KDT. However, by optimal optical pumping, you can achieve in a, even at room temperature a uh, value of about 0 0.7 for optically pumped uh, emitters, which is four orders of magnitude larger. And this we can also see, of course, in the plots. So here I'm showing you uh, the uh, line with shift, basically, more, more specifically, the maximum value of this uh, uh, um, modification of the line width as a function of the applied magnetic field. I'm showing you two curves, both correspond to optical pumping. They just correspond to different MV center densities. And now if I just turn off my optical pumping and try to see what is my modification for the same ensemble of emitters, but just in thermal equilibrium, I see they are, of course, four orders of magnitude smaller. But what is very interesting about this is where the bare line width of the spin waves lies, which is around here. And what this is telling us is that it is not possible to induce any strong modification of the spin waves with thermal, uh, in thermal equilibrium, okay? We need optical pumping. Or in other words, through optical pumping, we can really turn on and off this back action of the spin uh, of the uh, MV centers, and we can turn on and off the modification of the spin wave propagation, okay? So we have these two knobs that are very interesting, but the last piece of the puzzle is of course, okay, I have just shown you how some abstract modification of the line width can be attained and can be tuned and can be strong, but uh, okay, how does this really affect the real figures of merit of propagation, such as the dispersion relation of the spin waves, the propagation length of the, prop the group velocity? So to, to show this, we basically plotted all these three things. I start with the uh, dispersion relation of the spin wave. So I, I'm plotting here frequency of the spin waves in gigahertz versus wave vector. And you will notice it's a very narrow uh, range of wave vectors because again, the MV centers are affecting the spin waves only within a very narrow frequency, uh, frequency window. So this is the frequency window I'm showing here. The dashed line corresponds to the dispersion relation of the spin waves in the absence of MV centers, whereas the red line corresponds to the dispersion relation, the effective dispersion relations in the presence of the MV center back action for a density of 10 to the five MV centers per cubic micro. So you can see that the state, the, the, the change is quite noticeable, but what is very, very suggestive is this very sharp changes in the slope of this curve. Yeah, what do these changes in slope mean? This means that we will have enormous changes in the group velocity. So again, here I show you the group velocity in meters per second. Notice that this is a logarithmic scale and the same uh, uh, wave vector horizontal scale is shown. And I, I want to draw your attention to, uh, to three particular points. The first one is, is this maximum here, which represents a, a thousand fold increase in the group velocity achieved by the back action of the spin waves. Second one is this dashed line. I show here, dashed line means negative sign. So here I'm plotting the absolute value, but this is a, this, uh, so the dashed line keeps track of the sign. And in this whole region of dash line, it means that the group velocity is negative while the phase velocity is positive. So this means we have engineered backward wave propagation. And third is this point where negative becomes positive and in particular crosses zero where we basically stop uh, the propagation of spin waves. And some of these changes uh, you can also see for the propagation length. Again, this is the propagation length in millimeters versus wave vector. Um, we can see again a same maximum, which represents about 50% enhancement on the bare propagation length of the spin waves. 
And the reason why the propagation length does not increase as much as the group velocity is because the group velocity increase is also accompanied by an increase in the, in the decay rate. And also as evidenced by uh, this zero here, also the propagation length goes to zero, which really means we have stopped completely the spin wave. Uh, so the conclusion from this plot that we draw is that even with the very simplest spin bath that we have considered just randomly oriented spins, just optically pumped spins, we can really modify spin wave propagation, not only tunably and strongly, but in many different ways. We can get from enhanced propagation to completely suppressed propagation. Uh, so it just, it just takes me to, to the conclusions. Uh, just to summarize what I told you, it is possible to modify the spin wave propagation, how the spin wave uh, uh, moves, by externally controlling the state and the properties of an ensemble of solid state spins. In particular, I show you that it's possible to uh, attain full suppression of a propagation or enhancement of a propagation length with parameters that are currently achievable in experimental setups. I showed you that all these modifications are frequency selective. This means that with the external field, I can really choose which spin wave I modify. And they can also be turned on and off, uh, in particular through optical pumping. And we hope that this will really uh, give a cue to start exploring this direction and hopefully to devise new flexible uh, magnetic devices. And in the last 30 seconds, let me just show you uh, uh, my outlook for this because this is not, in my opinion, the end of the story. Okay, and in particular, if, if you notice, we have only assumed the simplest configuration of, of MV centers, but there's a lot of things that we know can be done that we, nobody has still yet explored. For instance, we can apply uh, microwave fields to make this the state of the MV centers time dependent. We can apply uh, uh, optical pumping with spatial patterning, which in principle can be op diffraction limited by optics. And this means we can create spatial patterns of optical pumping that are, are sub wavelength with respect to the spin waves. We can also uh, um, play with some memory effects by uh, using dynamical decoupling techniques for the MV centers. And in my opinion, using all these capabilities, one really can foresee the possibility of developing a whole new generation of spin steer devices, where basically through external control, this is this optical pumping represented here, one can write functionalities and operation in the MV ensembles from routing spin waves like it's shown here, to uh, uh, performing uh, logical operations or uh, devising repeaters and etc. All of these on a chip, all of these flexible, and all of these in principle completely reconfigurable because I can just turn off my uh, uh, my control and rewrite an, another circuit. Uh, so I hope you are uh, interested and intrigued by this field because there is a lot of room for work and our input as uh, uh, photonics experts is really needed because uh, um, this is our jam, okay? But still, uh, I, I really uh, encourage you to look, uh, to look into it because it's not just, you know, repeating the same things we have done with, with photonics. There's a lot of subtleties for magnetics and a lot of things we have to learn and a lot of challenges to, to develop. And with this, I would just to like to thank you for your attention. This is my collaborators in this work, Tueno van der Sar from TU Delft and Oriol Romero Sart from Innsbruck. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Uh, there are quite a few questions. The first one is by Francisco Garcia Vidal. I assume that you are working in the weak coupling regime. Is it possible or feasible to operate in the strong coupling regime and have magnum polaritons? It is possible. It has never been done, as far as I know. Uh, but this is the reason why I only show densities up to 10 to the 5 emitters per, per cubic micron in order to still work in the weak coupling regime. If you go to 10 to the 6 or 10, a bit more, then you will you will reach the, the, the strong coupling regime. Yeah, it is possible. Okay, uh, Javier Del Pino says that uh, you have shown that how language and frequencies can be tuned by means of exciting the paramagnetic ensemble through external fields. Could you also envision effective, coherent, and dissipative couplings that would mix spin waves with different K or related? Could you create gain besides loss? Maybe I miss this. You already implemented this. Yes, you can. I didn't say it, but if you in our paper, we basically uh, explore also this a bit. Uh, so in general, by for a general ensemble of MV centers, you will get any every kind of interaction between different Ks that will can help you amplify, for instance, spin waves. But uh, in this in this talk, I only showed what happens 
for a completely randomly uh, random distribution of MV centers, in which case this interaction average out to zero, but you can definitely, definitely do it. Yeah. Well, I suppose the qu question by Alejandro Gonzalez to the lights related that says, do you think that one can go to a regime where the non-linearity from emitters can be inherited from by the spin waves? Yes, I think so. But this is, in my opinion, for the magnonics uh, community, not that interesting because the spin waves already are quite nonlinear um, if you just crank up the power. But yes, you can do it. You, you can do it. Yeah. We have not explored. You have not explored it, but I'm, I'm sure you can because the theory in, in this regard is exactly the same as as uh, typical spin coupling theory. Okay, and the last question by Luis Rax that says that uh, in the context of interfacing and mediating interaction between further emitters, what is the significance of backwards waves? To be honest, in magnonics, the significance of backward waves is not that much. That's why I didn't highlight it very much in my conclusions. This is just something we get. What we are interested in is just molding the flow, getting to enhance or suppress the propagation. Backward waves. So far as I know, also in photonics is a bit um, a bit a phenomenon that is fancy to see, but it doesn't have as many applications as the other thing. So I, yeah, I couldn't think of one right now. Okay, there is another question that just pop up and is by Saru Sabasi and says that MB centers that have ground state S equal one, can we use the color centers with high ground state spin states? Yes, uh, as long as it's larger than one half, this should work. Our theory, we have not developed the theory for higher order speed, but in principle, there is no problem. Yeah. Okay, I think we should uh, stop here uh, and thank all, all the speakers. And uh, <clears throat> tomorrow we have another session that will start at uh, three o'clock Central European time. And we have a very interesting poster session at the end of the afternoon. So. Thank you all and see you tomorrow.